So I work graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. I can't say the company for obvious reasons, but I've been on this site for two weeks, this being the second. Basically every hour I make rounds across a giant recycling yard covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. Now, during my shift I scan various checkpoints and ensure that nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grass or bushy sort of terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of a warehouse far across. This is to ensure that it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2k lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. And well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the picture of the warehouse and submitted it. When all of a sudden I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. My hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I froze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. I slowly turn around and point my flashlight behind me. And I kid you not, about 10 yards away, I see a, a skinny old wrinkled white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western style cowboy fedora on. He was bare skin under the overalls too. Now, I'm a 6 foot, 220 pound guy, but I screamed at this, at a pitch that was honestly quite embarrassing. Accidentally, I dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are thin, tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight, and all I hear is a quick pace, a shuffling, a clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. Once the metal crunching footsteps are within about 5 feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within about 3 to 4 seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grabbed my flashlight from the ground and pointed to the sound. But the old man was gone, past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. When they arrived, that old man was long gone though. I believe maybe he was just there to watch the active trains move across. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still there in fact, I, I took a photo of it. More as a memento if anything. I am now in the office, honestly still a bit terrified and alone. I have to finish my shift tonight and tomorrow do another 11 hour graveyard shift. I won't quit as I honestly need the money, but I just wanted to get this off my chest. I grew up on the top of this mountain that was mostly abandoned since the 60s when an old ski kill burnt down. There were two other full-time residents up at the top where we lived. The rest of the houses stood empty the majority of the time, or were abandoned. The history of this mountain dates far back, hundreds of years ago in fact, before the colonization of Canada. There were two native communities at war here as well. One of them lived on the top of this mountain, and one lived in the valley below. At the base of the mountain, the two communities were supposed to meet for battle. During the journey down, the valley tribe snuck up behind the mountain tribe and slaughtered all their women and children. When the mountain tribe returned home, they were apparently slaughtered too. On the entire mountainside, these sort of vining wild strawberries grow there as well and it's said that they grow from the spilled blood of the mountain tribe. Many people have died on this mountain. When I was growing up, there were hundreds of old crosses littering the twists and turns up the mountain and my father also later became one of those crosses. In a small meadow surrounded by trees sat a small cottage no driveways and only an overgrown pathway to lead you to it. If you looked inside, their breakfast sat still prepared, oatmeal and eggs untouched for years. The man that lived there was supposedly a fugitive who disappeared further into the mountains when the police came up and found him one day. We had these weird neighbors too who would come two weekends a month from the city with their daughter who was my age. They would bring friends over, get high, drunk and naked and... 
get it on if you catch my drift in the yard or the forest. But there was this eerie feeling that you had while in this mountain, which was aptly named Forbidden. I stood looking at my bedroom window at night, and I swear that I could see things moving in the forest below. We also had the highest concentration of mountain lions in the world, and I was often stalked home. One night, my mother woke to the sound of the sliding door opening and closing. She walked downstairs, and my sister was standing there sleepwalking, whispering over and over, Here, kitty, kitty. My sister had never been a sleepwalker until this. My mother grabbed her, closed and locked the sliding door, then flicked on the lights. And there, right there on the deck, pacing back and forth, was a cougar. My father also became a violent sleepwalker while living up there. He would have screaming matches with the wall, sometimes ended up throwing items around. This wasn't something that he did until the last few years of his life. My father was a skilled driver and had driven up this mountain and many narrower, steeper logging roads around the area many times. And a few months before the accident, I started having waking nightmares of my father's death. Sometimes telling me that he was going to die and... I remember waking up frequently and looking out the window into the forest during this period and feeling like, I don't know, like something was communicating with me that he was about to die. He kissed me goodnight one night and went out the door to go to town with his friends. They left in separate vehicles, him first, and from the accounts of what happened, it was a, a freak accident. They were driving below speed limit down a straight stretch nearing a cliff or a corner when my dad's truck suddenly just lost traction and started skidding sideways towards the cliff. My dad apparently opened the truck door and jumped out, and the truck suddenly veered the other way and flipped straight onto him on the ground. Something that really physically shouldn't have actually happened or been possible even. It crushed almost every bone in his body and he survived for eight days in hospital after being airlifted. The day that he died though... I knew again. I knew that he was dead and it was like this feeling that something was communicating this to me. I didn't need to be told. I was so sure of this feeling that I collapsed onto the ground the second that I got this feeling and started screaming that he's dead, isn't he? He's dead. Just over and over again. I was eight at the time and I had never experienced death before but that feeling I'll never forget. There's a lot more too that went on up there to a lot of different people over the years. It's known locally as a haunted and weird place. Nothing good ever really happened there. People do weird and crazy stuff out of character things there too. Commit heinous crimes, die or just lose their minds apparently. We moved when I was nine and after I moved, I never felt that feeling again anywhere else. That feeling of something insidious just all around you all the time. I've only been up there a handful of times since then, and every time I have been up there, that feeling always returns. So yesterday, I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area too. For some background, the last time that we went... It was about a year ago, a car drove by and screamed nice butt at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location as well. Due to the lake's reputation, I had made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4pm without him. So with that said, this is what happened. My 12-year-old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up to our favorite fishing spot. A small pond on the opposite side of the road is the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if we were fishing in the pond. I replied that, yeah, we had just gotten started, but nothing yet, but that we had caught fish in the pond on plenty of other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. Maybe about 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. 
I just want to enjoy a day with my son and unfortunately the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky and I could tell that we weren't going to have any luck that day. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him that it's no problem and we were simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mum taking her kid fishing, how you don't see that very often, etc. I get this a lot, so I'm pretty used to it to be honest. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation though, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels a bit strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault sometimes, so I answer his question. I tell him that I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25? He tells me though that he's 38 and I'm too kind and... I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers so they always guess me well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. Turns out he lives there too and starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house or something. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program but it was a weird flex but okay man whatever. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take the hints and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now, my alarm bells are definitely blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typically dad thing with my kid. Now, he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite, even when you're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes that he'll see that I'm not some meek, submissive woman who's going to just agree with him. I mean, after all, I'm a, a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes that he'd just leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated... I tell him, oh well, you wouldn't like me at all then. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean it's okay to be loud I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know? I say, my man doesn't tell me anything, I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth though, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, Yeah, say that again, honey. And this distracted the creep just long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe though. Unbeknownst to Creepazoid, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks. But at least they're on the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice. Nothing. And I mean, of all the times for my car to act up, why on earth did it choose then? Panic has set in now, and as I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life, and I peel out of there as quickly as I can. Only then do I let my composure crumble, and... I have a long talk with my son about what had just happened. I made a new deal with my dad that day to never go to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. This happened around three years ago and thinking about it, it still makes me feel really uneasy. I live in a rural area surrounded by a nature conservation area. 
There are many nice paths here and it's great and peaceful and a quiet place to go for walks, ride bikes, etc. And on this day, I decided to take my dog for a walk there in the evening. I didn't want to go that far that day and for some reason I decided to leave my phone at home even though I usually take it with me just in case. Everything was going well and as usual I barely met anyone on there. But at some point I got to my favourite spot, a wooded area. There's a field behind it and I planned on walking all the way to the end. Then I wanted to turn around and take the same way home. As I continued walking after I made it through the wooded area, my dog started acting a bit strange. She kept looking back and didn't seem to want to go on. I thought that she spotted a deer or maybe a rabbit and wasn't concerned. I didn't look around right away, but then she let out a sort of little growl or bark. I had really never heard her do that before. I turn around and sure enough, there is a man standing on the edge of the wooded area or field, like maybe 10 meters next to the path. He was fully clothed and didn't move and he was just staring at us. My heart instantly was pounding. And no matter where I would go, I would still be in a secluded area for a while. I didn't think and just started walking quickly towards the end of the field. My dog still wasn't having it. When I turned around after getting a bit further away, he had also moved. Now he was standing on the field, still staring intensely. That was when I really knew that we had to get out of here. I didn't look back until we got to the end of the field. Because of some of the trees, my view was a bit obstructed, but I couldn't see him and my dog seemed a bit calmer now. Obviously, I really didn't want to stop for more than a few seconds, though. From there on, I decided to take the one path that would take me to some part of my town the quickest. We literally ran and I was really relieved when we made it back. Back to civilization, that is. Now, I still have no idea what this guy's intentions were. I will say that just appearing out of nowhere like that is strange. And the way that he just followed us and watched us standing still like that, I don't know. He was acting strangely and something just told me that something was wrong. I'm just really proud of my dog for alerting me because if they hadn't, I really don't know what would have happened. About eight years ago, my friends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Urbexing, that is. Definitely not the smartest idea, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. But anyway, this one night, we met a guy called Todd. Todd was an odd guy from the beginning. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point, a very interesting place in West Virginia. You should look it up if you're into ghost and haunted history. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area while us girls went ahead to explore, which was a red flag. I was convinced at the time that he was about to try and steal my car, but we went into the abandoned hospital and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. Scared us really badly. We let out a slight scream, in fact. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum. It's right next to the hospital. And that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, how much fun would that be? Well, we continued to explore and Todd just sort of hung out in the background. We eventually left and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas so I started to drive to the nearest gas station. And maybe about two minutes up the winding road, I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders. As I'm driving, mind you, I kept leaning forward to give him the hint that I was not interested. As he's massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out, how we never know who is getting in the car and how they might hurt us, etc. He started laughing again and I will never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders as he said, 
Maybe that person's in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and I instantly demanded that he get out of the car. He did and I just left him there. We got back home eventually and my friend went on to plenty of fish to block him but he had already blocked her or deleted his account. We never did hear from him again but we definitely stopped inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. I randomly recall this memory at times, and I am so glad that my parents taught us not to trust strangers, and I'm even more thankful for my sister actually listening. So back in the 90s, my two siblings and I were walking from our house towards our bus stop to go to school. For context, I was seven, my brother was eight, and my sister was almost eleven. It was a foggy morning, and the walk was almost too quiet we were the only ones in line of sight we were a few streets away from the bus stop when a small white sedan pulled up next to us slowly matching our pace we looked over slightly confused and curious at a white woman with long curly brown hair in the driver's seat she was staring at us intently she was probably around 35 to 40 from the looks of her this continued for a few seconds before she rolled down her window and said, Hey kids, heading to school? She had this weird smile though and eyes that looked like they were looking through us. We nodded as it was obvious with our backpacks. She coaxed us with a wave. Why don't you three hop in? I can take you to school. I, of course, being seven and lazy, was all about a free ride. Sure, I said smiling. My sister grabbed my arm tightly, so tightly that it hurt me. No thanks, my sister said sternly. The woman's smile seemed to fade and reappear in a fraction of a second. Oh, it's fine, really. You don't have to walk. I can take you quickly, she said, trying to sound kind. That's when I felt the hairs on my neck stand up. No, my sister said, even more stern now. My brother looked scared right now and... I was confused and alarmed at this facial expression that I'd never seen on him before. The woman then turned the wheel and pulled closer to the curb toward us. We all stopped in our tracks out of fear. Get in the car, she said as she stopped the car. Her smile vanished and was replaced by a toothy sneer. She was close enough that I could see her dark brown pits for eyes. And I swear that she just glared at us with what looked like pure evil. That was it. My sister picked me up and yelled to my brother to run. I don't know how to, but all of a sudden she just had this Hulk-like strength. She and my brother started sprinting as fast as they could down the sidewalk. I clutched my sister tightly, screaming. They almost fell twice in the process. Thankfully, the car never turned around, and instead it sped forward and turned down the street. But they didn't stop running until we made it home. We locked the door and we were all sobbing. My mum and father both were working so we couldn't contact them until they came home. But we only had landlines back then and pages were only for adults. And that's basically it. If it wasn't for my sister, I'm pretty convinced that I would have been kidnapped that day. I guess the case in point here is that you should teach your kids to never trust strangers because apparently I didn't listen. My mum lives in Ohio at the top of a hill on a country road and one day my son, aged eight at the time, was riding his scooter up and down the road, something he wasn't actually allowed to do for safety reasons but anyway... This country road has woods on both sides, but they are particularly dense on either side, and fields and a utility crossing splits the roadside woods from the bigger sections of the forest. Now, he suddenly comes running up the hill, wide as a ghost, teary-eyed, and says that he saw something scary in the woods. He's almost inconsolable at this point. He finally gets calmed down and we ask him what he saw, and he says that it was kind of like a stick figure but thicker. It was all black but had no facial features and looked just like the man on the bathroom signs. 
Of course, we went to check it out. He took us to a specific area, pointed out exactly where it was, even showed us how much taller it was than a dead tree in the area, roughly seven feet tall. But he was physically shaking the whole time that he was showing us and talking about it, which I'd never seen that happen to him before. We told him that it was probably a warning to stay out of the road, but I don't know, what could it have been? Has anyone ever seen anything like this before? Also, to give a, a little bit more detail, this didn't happen recently. My son is 11 now, but he's pretty familiar with Slenderman, Bigfoot, I'd say even Shadow People. He likes scary stuff. So, I feel like if it was any of those, he would have called it that or even said it looked like one of those things. I've even asked him if it looked like a stick man and he says kind of, but it really looked just like the man on the bathroom signs. He still remembers it too, and he's more curious about it than scared these days, but still, the fact that he swears by it, it definitely has me intrigued. This happened about 15 years ago now. So my buddies and I went fish camping at a pretty remote lake off of a 4x4 trail, about two hours from home. There were four of us, all men with me being the smallest at 195 pounds. The camping spot has great fishing as it has a nice deep spot with lots of trout right next to it. But the campground itself, it's rough. It is on the side of a steep hill with barely enough room for tents and a small ring fire. It is accessible by a rough steep winding 100 yard trail from where you park your 4x4 above the camp. But we had a great day drinking beers and catching our limits on some nice sized trout. After it got dark we made a small fire and we just sort of messed around the whole night. It was a great time but suddenly there was someone shining a blinding light in our eyes from about maybe 10 to 20 yards away. We didn't hear this person approach at all. This person announced themselves as the sheriff. One of my friends asked, Are you so-and-so, our county sheriff? The stranger didn't respond to the question, though. Instead, he shined a light in each of our faces and said, You have a good night, then just walked off. We sort of sat there dumbfounded, asking each other, What the heck was that? And after a minute or two, curiosity eventually got the better of me, so... I lit up this person with my stupidly powerful flashlight. He was about 50 to 60 yards away at this point, right before a crest and bend off the trail, right before he was out of sight. And we all saw it. It was just some dude in a flannel shirt and jeans. I said, that is not a sheriff. He must have heard me too, as you could see him start moving quickly for a second before he was out of sight. A few moments later... We heard an engine start and that was that. It was pretty strange that we didn't hear the vehicle earlier but I attribute that to being drunk and loud I suppose. But what makes this kind of scary is what if it wasn't four big dudes that he approached? What if it was a single person or even a couple? What did he intend to do? Should we have chased after this person? Well, that's debatable, I guess, but should we have reported this to the actual sheriff's department? Absolutely. But sadly and stupidly, we never did. So, this happened when I was about 11. I'm female. I had a friend over at my dad's house for the first time, 12 and female, and we were having a lot of fun that day. My dad went out into the front yard to take a phone call or something, I think. At this time, it must have been around 10.30 at night, and we were hyped up off of a Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, and were so hyper that we went outside with my dad. We mainly stayed in the front yard until we decided that we wanted to go inside. Me and my friend jumped my back fence because we were right next to it. For context too, I had a pit bull and a very large German Shepherd who were also in my backyard. Me and my friend, we went up to the second floor and were playing with makeup. Maybe about 30 minutes later, we went back downstairs because I heard my dogs barking and I decided to let them in. The dogs had their own fenced off area in the backyard to not interfere with the garden. 
My friend pointed out that my dad was still out on the front porch, which, okay, cool, whatever. I went to my back door to open it, and I saw a man crouching by the back gate, staring at my back door. He was next to the side of the gate that we had previously jumped. I asked my friend to stay there and make sure the man stayed there too, and I was going to check if my dad was still on the front porch, and he was. For whatever reason, I never did tell my dad that this man was in our backyard. Instead, me and my friends watched him out there for about 20 minutes. After these 20 minutes, he moved across the street, crouched next to a car for 5 minutes, then comes back to the gate. I decided that it was unsafe for my dogs to still be out in the yard, so I turned on the light to help me see clearer and let the dog's gate open. After I let my dogs in, this guy is still crouched and not moving a bit. Ten more minutes, which seemed like a long time when you're going through it, pass by, and the man is still there but stands up. After seeing this man stand up, I realized that he is holding something. It looked a lot like a metal pipe. At that, I locked the door and me and my friend ran across the house to the front door to tell my dad to come inside. I never gave him an explanation as to why, but I'm guessing that he saw the urgency in my face or voice and he listened because he came in pretty quickly. After that, we looked outside, but by that point, the man was gone. I still think back to that day and I often wonder if, when we jumped the fence, if he saw us and... I don't know, something tells me that maybe he was hoping that we would jump that fence again. I don't usually share this, but there's something that's been weighing heavily on my mind and I just feel the need to share it. It happened when I was just 13 years old and... It's an incident that still remains a bit hazy in my memory, but I'll try to recall it as best as I can. So, the amusement park, the only renowned one in our state, had recently opened its gates as the seasons transitioned into summer. For privacy reasons, I won't disclose the park's name or the ride where this unsettling event occurred, but typically I visited the park once or twice a year with my friends, family, and occasionally my parents as well. We would roam around, indulge in tasty treats, and experience the thrill of the rides. Just regular kid stuff. However, this particular visit was destined to make me swear off amusement parks pretty much for the rest of my days. It was a chilly night, that mix of cold and warm from all of the stuff around you. However, the sky remained clear, which was all the confirmation that my friends, Nick and Caden, and I needed to ask our parents if we could go. Miraculously, they all agreed and in no time we found ourselves being dropped off at the park's entrance, brimming with excitement, ready to immerse ourselves in the vibrant, thrilling attractions. Among them, there was one ride that stood out as my personal favourite, and I'm certain that my friends felt the same way too. Housed inside of a dome-shaped building, this exhilarating ride dazzled us with a whirlwind of spinning lights and adrenaline-pumping speeds. It seemed like the perfect choice. Well, except for one thing, the dreaded line. Not only was it a claustrophobic person's worst nightmare, but it almost always guaranteed an agonizing wait of at least an hour. And on that particular occasion, the line stretched so far back that it reached one of the neighboring rides, about a hundred yards away. Seeing this, we all let out exasperated sighs, realizing that we had no choice but to endure the line before we could move on. We figured that we might as well get it out of the way early. As the line snaked its way forward, we noticed that on the left side, where the line extended towards the forest, there were shrubs and bushes. My friends and I, we didn't really pay much attention to them at first, which is why we failed to notice something peculiar until we reached the large sign bearing the ride's name. It was Caden who first spoke up, excitement laced with a, a hint of concern evident in his voice. Hey, did you guys see that? He exclaimed, pointing in the direction of the forest. No? What are you talking about? Nick replied, glancing over at the bushes. Curiosity peaked. I looked in the same direction. And there, 
crouched down among the foliage was a person wearing a, a Jason mask. Initially, we just found it amusing, thinking that it was a part of some Halloween-themed event or partly that the amusement park occasionally hosted in October. However, it was July, a fact that should have raised more suspicion, in hindsight, I guess. Whether it was ignorance or just us being naive kids, we just chuckled, assuming that it was just some kid playing a harmless prank. Our attention quickly returned to the ride, and we dismissed the incident as an inconsequential oddity. In the end, we endured the line for a grueling two hours, and despite the relatively brief five-minute ride itself, it was undeniably worth the wait. Afterward, we decided to grab a bite to eat and enjoy a few more attractions. Time flew by, and before we knew it, it was time to head back to the parking lot, where our parents would be waiting. Unlike other kids who would typically complain, we welcomed the idea of leaving as exhaustion started to creep in. Amusement parks can be quite demanding like that, and with two hours in line, that seemed to do the trick. Navigating through the throngs of people also making their way towards the exit, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, a glimpse of that very same Jason mask. This time, I managed to catch a glimpse of the full figure behind it. The person, whoever they were, was massive, towering at least six foot six with a, a build reminiscent of a freight train. This man was a behemoth and it became glaringly evident that it wasn't just some kid playing a childish prank anymore. Subtly urging my friends to quicken their pace, we hustled toward the exit. As we reached the dark expanse of the parking lot, I finally gathered the courage to share what I had seen. I told them what I saw and how big this guy was, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and disbelief. Yeah, right, Nick responded, who was always the skeptic, especially when it came to this sort of stuff. Caden, however, remained silent, his gaze fixated on the park behind us, an uneasiness apparent in his eyes. No, seriously, I insisted, my voice growing more urgent as Nick and I engaged in a brief back and forth. Caden's next words cut through our heated exchange, causing us to pause and snap our heads back in the direction of the park. Little did I know that his revelation would unleash an unprecedented terror, leaving a mark on my childhood memories. Guys, look, Caden said, his voice tinged with terror as he began sprinting toward the parking lot. At first, all I could see were the masses of people flooding out of the park. I didn't understand what had spooked him so profoundly, and Nick appeared equally confused. But then, I saw it. The Jason mask once again. This time, the significance of its presence registered in our minds, and we just bolted in sheer panic. The colossal figure adorned with the mask was hurtling toward us though at an alarming speed, and seemed to be clutching something in his hand, a mysterious cloth that I never really had the chance to examine closely, so I really don't know what it was. But we ran, we ran as if our lives depended on it, eventually catching up to Caden in the vast expanse of the parking lot. Together, we gasped for breath, scanning our surroundings in a frenzied state, until we spotted my parents' car. Without wasting a second, we scrambled inside, screaming at them to floor it. Although they wore expressions of bewilderment and concern, my dad pressed down on the accelerator, propelling us away from that nightmare as swiftly as possible. Interrogation became the theme of our one-hour car drive back home, and it was Nick who mustered the courage to offer brief, one-word answers to our parents' relentless questions. In truth, all of us were still reeling from the shock, I guess, struggling to process the enormity of what had just occurred. To this day, I still remain baffled by the man's intentions. What did he actually want with us? Why did he single us out? Why did he do this with a ton of people around? And what horrors awaited us if he had managed to close the distance between us? I vowed never to return to that specific amusement park, although I visited others since then. Nevertheless, you can bet your bottom dollar that I always keep a vigilant eye forever wary of lurking shadows because these days 
You just never know who might be hiding in the darkness, waiting to pounce like that. So, I'm from Brownsville, Texas, and one night I was at my girlfriend's house. We were having a normal evening, watching a movie and relaxing in bed at around 9pm. And since nobody else was home, we were surprised when we heard a sort of robotic-like voice coming from outside the window. I checked, but I didn't see anything. This happened twice though, and then we heard a noise coming from the kitchen. My girlfriend had cats in the house at the time, so we thought that it might be them and we didn't pay much attention. However, the noises continued and they were louder the second time. We jokingly checked the living room and the kitchen, but found nothing unusual, so we just went back to bed. Suddenly, though, we heard the noises again for the third time, and this time we decided to thoroughly check the entire house. However, we couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. The cats were also missing, as if they were hiding. My girlfriend went back to her room, and I followed her. Before entering the room, I had a strange feeling though and decided to look out into the hallway. It was dark and I really couldn't see much, but suddenly I heard a, a human whistle. Thinking that it was my girlfriend, I smiled and laughed a little. However, when I looked at her, she seemed genuinely terrified and asked me to close the door. I locked it as she requested. In the end, we suspected that someone had entered the house and I was ready to call 911. However, my girlfriend insisted that I shouldn't. Instead, we decided to run out of the house. I locked the bottom lock of the door from the inside and I just went straight to my car. I was terrified and shaking and I wanted to call my dad and ask him to bring a gun, but my girlfriend convinced me not to. Instead, I called my friends and asked them to come with a baseball bat. We waited outside to see if anyone would come out of the house, but nobody ever did. I told my friends that we should go inside and confront the burglar with the bats that they brought. However, when I tried to open the door, I realized all of a sudden that it was locked. It was then that I remembered locking it before leaving, so we decided to go to the restaurant instead and get the keys from my girlfriend's mum. I asked my friends to stay outside and call the police if they saw anyone. When we returned, we positioned ourselves behind the door ready to open it. I unlocked the bottom lock and turned the knob, but to my surprise and fear, the top lock that required a key to lock was also locked. We didn't have the key when we originally ran out, and this confirmed to me that somebody must be inside. I unlocked the top lock using the keys that we had, and we quickly entered the house expecting to find somebody inside. However, after searching the entire house, and I mean, we checked all the windows, doors, everything. Everything just seemed untouched and locked. Since then, my friends and I have been unable to explain what actually happened that day. The top lock, which needed a key to be locked, was locked when we returned, even though we didn't have the key to begin with. Moreover, we still can't explain the human whistling sound that my girlfriend and I heard, and the whistling had a sort of mocking tone to it. When her mum got home, we told her what happened and she told us that morning that she heard my girl laughing loud while the TV was on and she told her girlfriend, Natalie is laughing so loud, I haven't heard her laugh like that in a long time. But my girl was not home that morning. She had slept over at a friend's house. In any case, a few months later, my girlfriend's mum was preparing to move out of that house. She was doing some final checks and making sure all the doors were locked. However, the next day when she went back to the house, she noticed that the back doors were wide open. This seemed strange to her, so she locked the doors again and turned in the keys. A few days later, the realtor who had the keys called my girlfriend's mum and asked if she had entered the house again and opened the back doors. She denied it, explaining that she didn't have the keys anymore. The realtor informed her though that the previous day, when they went to check the house, the back doors were wide open and they had definitely originally closed and locked them. 
but when they returned the next day, the doors, they were wide open once again. I, a 23-year-old female, was recently in Africa on vacation with my family, and we stayed two nights at a desert camp in the Sahara. The first night, my sister and I, we were talking and hanging out with the guys who worked there, who were all probably around, maybe ages 20 to 35. But they seemed friendly and harmless for the most part. I noticed at the campfire that night that one of the guys started paying more attention to me, and I felt a little bit uncomfortable, but... I figured that it was just a language barrier or something. So, out in the desert, you can see the stars really well out there, and even the Milky Way on clear nights. But you have to wait for the moon to go down, which is at around 2am. I guess it's a normal thing for the guys to come around to the tents, which are luxury tents furnished with beds, lights, a toilet, and shower as well as a, a lock on the doors. So, definitely not normal camping. They often knock on the door to see if you're awake and want to come out to look at the stars at night. My sister and I, we were sharing a tent, my parents in a separate one across the walkway. The first night at around midnight, I told my sister that I was too tired to go out because I was falling asleep. So she left to look at the stars without me and I didn't lock the door because I didn't want her to get locked out if I fell asleep. Fast forward about an hour and I'm on my side asleep when... I wake up suddenly to see a head peeking in from the tent door. I thought that it was my sister, so I groggily asked her, What are you doing? Because it was just really weird the way that she was just standing there. I start to wake up a bit more and I then realize that it's this guy from the campfire's head peeking in my room while I'm asleep. Now, I know that it could have been a simple misunderstanding, but... I felt totally violated with my privacy, especially because we were on their territory in the middle of the desert. Like, I'm not kidding, we had to take a 30 minute truck ride into the dunes to get here. Harmless mistake or not, I was in fight or flight at that moment. He literally woke me up with a panic attack, so I went to the door and told him that I was tired. He kept trying to get me to come out to the dunes with a blanket, the classic male move, right? But I just kept saying no, I, I didn't feel well and was tired, which was true. At this moment too, I really don't know where my sister is, I don't know where my family is. I'm disoriented like anything and all I know is that this man is standing in front of me and was literally just watching me sleep. I don't know how long he was there for, it could have been a literal second or it could have been, well, a lot longer than that. But either way... I was high-key horrified. I told him again no, and said that I'd go look at the stars tomorrow night. He told me that he wouldn't be at the camp the next night, and that's why he wanted to go out tonight, but I just wouldn't budge. Once he realized that I wasn't going to come outside, he asked if he could have my number, and I told him no, I have a boyfriend. I don't, but it seemed the only way that this man would respect my disinterest was by knowing that there was another man in the picture. After I said that, he asked me for my first name and I gave it to him because I thought that it wouldn't do any harm. And then I said goodnight and I locked the door this time. I went right to the bathroom after this and while I was on the toilet, I heard him come back and start calling my name from outside the tent, but I just stayed quiet and I didn't say anything. I finished in the bathroom and I lay back down in bed still trying to calm down from what had just happened because my heart was racing. I heard him come back again calling my name. I laid in bed as still as I could and I didn't say anything. I tried texting my dad but he was not answering and I didn't feel comfortable leaving the tent at that point. Finally though, my sister came back and my dad was with her so I told them what had just happened and they were confused and thought that it was weird and that was kind of it. The next day I brought it up at breakfast again and my sister and dad basically told me that I was just being dramatic and that I should just stop talking about it already because it wasn't that big of a deal. My mum was the only one who was like, yeah, that's really not okay. And the second night my sister and I were both out under the stars talking to the guys and relaxing. Keep in mind it's very dark out here and you can't see any faces. 
So I was having a normal convo with this one guy, couldn't see him and all is well. And after a while, he asks me if I remember him and I'm like, well, no, I, I really can't see you. He's like, oh, shine a light. So I do and wouldn't you know it, it's the same guy from my tent. I really wasn't expecting him to be the dude in front of me because he had told me that he wouldn't be there that night. Which leads me to believe that he picked up a shift just to see me, but I really couldn't be sure. Surprisingly, he was fine that night and respected my boundaries, so I didn't say anything to the guys who ran the camp. I was planning on doing so if he did anything remotely uncomfortable, but he didn't. The next morning, we left the area, and a few days later, I start getting message requests on Instagram. Would you believe that somehow... This guy found me. I mean, I tagged the entire desert. And you're telling me that he found me based on my name and a location? Not even a specific location, but an entire desert? And my name is not unique by any means either. Anyway, he messages me and although I'm creeped out a bit, I'm also thinking, okay, well, now he's harmless. I might as well see what he says. And he says... You know I'm really so happy to find your account. I was looking for you all the time. Which I found very creepy to even say to someone. But again, I don't know. It could just be a cultural difference. But who knows. I didn't answer and he messaged me again a few days later saying, Hey, how are you? But again, I didn't answer. But why I bring this up is I'm curious what you guys think about this and... If I really was just overreacting, or if you think my literal gut feeling was right. He seemed to be harmless around other people in the end, but I don't know. The way that his head just popped in my tent at night when nobody else was around and I was the only one there. It was weird, to say the least. So... I'd like to share a few things about the old house of my grandfather's prehistory. The house, it was built around 200 years ago. As far as I know, there were often soldiers in World War II there, and a few often given shelter as well. One disappeared after a few days without a trace, and it was also an old restaurant. About 40 years later, my grandpa found an old cross in the garbage and decided to restore it. After a few weeks, strange things started happening too. Mary and Jesus pictures started to sway without wind or any human influence. But the whole house was shaking without wind that day or similar and in Bavaria there are also no earthquakes really but they also had loud noises in the basement. My grandfather then mounted the cross on a nearby tree and since then it is always foggy around that tree. My grandmother had cancer and died of it and she had a phone in her room, which was only connected to the phone in the living room if she needed help. What I mean is that she could not call anyone else with it, and a few days later when she died, the phone rang in the living room with the number of my grandmother's phone. But when you answered the phone, you could only hear breathing and then it would hang up. This was weird too because, well, first, there was no longer a connection to the phone downstairs, and secondly, the contract of the phone was terminated. My grandpa then died December of 2015. And now, 2023, I myself have already experienced, well, many things. The first story is that me and a buddy went at uh, about 11 o'clock at night to the house to get something. When we got to the kitchen, to get into the kitchen, you have to go from a hallway left through a door... We then closed the door behind us, and suddenly somebody knocked. We panicked, but still decided to open the door, but when we did, there was nothing there. Suddenly, though, there was another loud bang. We ran quickly back to the kitchen, and after a few minutes, we heard footsteps in front of the door. We then looked outside, but again, there was no one to be seen. We then heard someone from the hallway run toward us, but... There was no one there either. At that, but we just left and we didn't come back that night. The second thing that happened was I and a colleague have met in the evening and we were chilling in the living room 
The living room is directly connected to the kitchen. After a few minutes, we heard above us a, a loud bang and loud footsteps. My friend panicked and waited outside, and I went upstairs alone to look around, and I looked, but there was no one up there. On another occasion, once, a, a friend and me decided to set up two cameras in the hallway. At the end of the hallway, there goes a, a sort of door straight into the stall, and on the right to a stair to the bedrooms, and there's an attic too. And my buddy pointed his camera towards the stairs and to the beginning of the hallway. I pointed my camera from the beginning of the hallway towards the end. And when we went to get both phones, both phones were on the floor with the camera pointing towards the ceiling. But both videos were cut off at the exact same time and both fell to the floor at the exact same time. That seems almost impossibly unlikely, so we're still scratching our heads over that one. Another thing that happened was me and a friend went to the house at night. We wanted to film on the second floor and at the top of the stairs there were three doors. One at the front, one to the left and one to the right. We went to the right floor and at the door there is a chair to block this door so we got into the hallway where at the end right and left are open doors. We then went in and we discovered something really weird. When we looked at the recordings afterwards... You could see in the left door a hand and a face. It was clear to see, but we checked the rooms and there was no one there. We went back and forth a few times too. We went up the stairs, looked around, there was nothing there. Went back downstairs, looked at the live feed and there was someone there. And finally, on another occasion, when my cousin and I were kids, we slept at my grandpa's house at one point. We went to the toilet at night when we suddenly heard very loud scratching on the front door. We then thought that we were pranking each other, but then it happened again at the same time, and we were talking, and my mother had lived there about two months after the separation with my father in the house, because it is her parents' house. And she said that after a few weeks she felt really uncomfortable, not welcome, and always watched. She had a lot of sleep paralysis and also heard footsteps, and loud noises like scratching on doors. She quickly moved out after this and she never came back. Honestly, I could go on because things happened again and again in this place. Lights going on and off, doors opening on their own, things lying on the floor that shouldn't be there, footsteps, voices, things moving. Most of the time, people that came over felt very uncomfortable in this place too. At each visit, Strange things would always happen as well. I'm going to spend a few days in the house alone and I'm actually going to take a camera and try to film something. If I get anything, I'll be sure to post it here and if you're interested, you can watch it. And what I'm hoping is that you can help me figure out what's going on here. And please let me know if someone has experienced similar things and what you did about it. Also, I'm sorry if this feels a bit unorthodox, this story. I'm actually German, and I tried my best to write this text in English, and hopefully it makes sense. In any case, like I said, I'm going to go back for a few days, and if I catch anything, well, I'll share it with you guys. So I sleep in the basement of a, a one-story house out in the country. I've never seen or heard anything unexplainable until, out of nowhere, weird noises could be heard outside of our house one night. About three years ago, the first noises were heard by both me and my mum. We had let the dog out around 12 at night and were letting him back in and talking when we heard a sound that no animal could make. It sounded like a a large cat that had its throat slit. It was like a, a gargling meow and we both immediately stopped talking and looking outside to see if there was anything just outside because that's where it sounded like it was coming from, just beyond where our house's lights could reach but we couldn't see anything. It was like something just letting you know that it's there then not doing anything or making another sound. The next incident happened a couple of months after when I was sleeping outside my room since I didn't have a bed at the time and the futon couldn't fit through my doorway. It was late at night, I was watching TV and I heard what sounded like someone moving stuff around just outside of my laundry room. 
The layout of my basement is pretty open, so from where I was laying I could see almost everything in the basement, except the laundry room and another open area at the bottom of the stairs. So I honestly thought that someone might have come down to get something from the fridge or the freezer, so I just went back to watching TV. But a couple of seconds later I heard someone walking around barefoot, and since the floor is concrete, you can hear it pretty clearly. So I sat up and thought that somebody was going to turn the corner, but then the walking turned into a full-on sprint, and that was when it happened. I watched as the footsteps ran past in front of me, but nobody was there. They disappeared into our unfinished bathroom and stopped instantly, and when I say instantly, I mean no slowdown in the footsteps, just an abrupt stop. My dog used to sleep in the bathroom, but after that, he refused to even come downstairs. After that, I had my first and last sleep paralysis episode too, where I heard the same footsteps before a pitch black person on all fours crawled at me and got right in my face before disappearing under the futon. And the final incident happened probably three or four months later when I was finally back in my room. I was laying in bed when I heard those footsteps again, but it sounded like they were running around sort of aimlessly. After a good minute of this, they stopped in front of my door and it went quiet, but only for a few seconds before my doorknob began to jiggle back and forth. I have never had that sense of dread ever in my life too, and I have never been that scared before. I ran to my door, grabbed the knob, and sat with my back against the door and my feet pushing against the wall opposite. I even looked under the door and... I confirmed that there was nothing there. I probably sat there for 30 minutes before I got the courage to move and throughout those 30 minutes I kept looking under the door and there was nothing. I slept with a steel bar that night because I was absolutely convinced that there was someone in our house. Since that night nothing major has happened but sometimes when I come back into my room and close the door I'll turn around and my door, for whatever reason, will be open again. So I don't really normally share stories often, but I've been listening to some here and it sparked an encounter that I had years ago on a solo bike tour that I thought was worth sharing. So... It was the spring after I graduated college. I'm 22 and female, and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I decided to take a pause and ride my bike down the coast from Canada to Mexico. I was pretty nervous to be going by myself, but for the majority of the time I felt safe. Halfway through or so, I got pretty comfortable with sleeping alone in fairly empty campsites and parks, etc. There were even some stretches on the trip that I rode with other bike tourists, and this one encounter, however, brought my guard back up for the remainder for sure. So I was halfway down the Oregon coast and was a mile or so out from the campground that I had planned to stay for the night. There was this notable yellow vintage Ferrari, I think it was, car that had passed me headed in the opposite direction. When I pulled into the campground, I stopped at the information board to look at the map and the fees. As I'm sitting there, I see the yellow car coming down the road and stops where I am. This older guy in his late, uh, maybe 50s or early 60s, gets out and starts looking at the board with me. He's friendly and seems completely normal, charismatic even. He's asking me about my trip and starts mentioning how he's from the area but has never checked out this campground. At this point, I'm still pretty naive. There's plenty of nice people that I've met on the trip that chat me up and ask me about the bike tour. He's talking to me and getting closer and this part is what starts to make me a bit uneasy. He would repeatedly reach out his hand to shake mine like he was about to leave but every time he shook my hand he would grab my forearm with his other hand and do this weird sort of gasp laugh thing. The way that he did it looked absolutely insane and the arm grasp was very firm. It immediately sent shivers down my spine but then he suddenly dives into another topic and repeats this freaky handshake maybe two more times in between. I realize then that I'm completely out of sight from anyone in the campground, 
have no phone service, and I'm now very close to him and his open car door. There's a knot in my stomach. I'm on the verge of tears, and my voice is shaking with every response. At the time, I didn't know why, but something just felt very off about him. I finally speak up loud, hoping somebody can hear me, and tell him that I have to get going, run to my bike, and speed to the campground. When I get there, I don't even try to find the hike and bike spots and just throw tent down directly across from the camp host. And thankfully, I, I didn't see him after that. Again, I had a lot of encounters with random strangers at this point, but none of them terrified me like this one did. I fought with the idea that he was probably just an overly friendly guy, but the fact that he would repeatedly grab my arm like that and laugh like that was frightening. All in all, most people that I met were sweet and it made me very trusting of others. And even if he was harmless, his actions were a good reminder that I had to be mindful of my vulnerable situation and I had to be much more alert. So something a little bit eerie, I guess you could say, happened to me one night on night shift when I was closing and doing outside trash, a chore that I have to do because I was closing. I was listening to music since there were no customers and the lot was empty. Two of my co-workers, cook and manager, were both inside doing what they had to do before leaving. I noticed a red car pulling into a stall, but not all the way. The car was parked in this strange way, kind of sort of sideways and far away from the stall where they would call in, I guess. I noticed it was an elderly couple and the husband rolls his windows down and says something. I couldn't really hear him, so I paused my music and asked if he could repeat. And it sounded like he said, are you here alone? So I laughed and said, no, I wasn't alone. They stayed there for a while before pulling out. But they stopped for such an unusual amount of time in the middle of the lot that it was a bit weird. This was when one of my co-workers walked out leaving. He's around the same age as me and we said our goodbyes. As I continued doing the trash, I noticed the car had went back to the main road in front of my workplace, but only to turn back into the lot again in a sort of slow and unusual way. I started to freak out a bit and I tried to hurry at this point. I noticed the car was gone for a while, so I thought that they left. So I was heading back to the dumpster, the big one, to throw away the trash bags when I saw it. The red car was right behind the dumpster at the stop sign. It was parked there, and this was when I quickly called my brother and I put him on speaker. I talked so loudly that anyone could hear me, and I was honestly on the verge of tears. Once I hung up though, the car had finally started to move slowly, paused for a moment again, then finally left for good. I don't know what really happened, but I just felt like I was being stalked that night. I don't know if they had good intentions or not, but I realized that my co-worker had stayed in his truck with the engine running the whole time. I can't remember exactly, but I do believe that his truck was right next to the dumpster and he may not have known what was going on, but... I'm really thankful that he didn't leave just yet because I'm kind of coming to grips with the fact that maybe, maybe this was an attempted kidnapping or something. This was my very first job, so I don't know if this was common or not, or if the people just were looking out for me or something, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this normal, or should I have been more concerned? I haven't told anyone at work about what happened. And I'm wondering if I should. What do you guys think? So I'll need to explain some context here, so bear with me. Rock Island is a state park located at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. It's a pretty difficult place to get to, in fact. To get to the island, you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jackson Harbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Now, even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it has had an interesting history. 
In the early 1600s, it was inhabited by a tribe of Native Americans as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups, they didn't trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence, but for the most part they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s, the Native Americans had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after they had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They seemed to be more white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers or even find where they were living. It was around this time too that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals, it's not mentioned what they were, but maybe it was pigs or chickens kept by the settlers, were found slaughtered in the village and seemed to have been used to make markings and blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night, a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island and they intended to find them, but after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found a, a single person. These strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search and none of the other settlers were ever seen again as well. In 1836, the lighthouse that was built on the northern part of the island, after construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and the dwelling are made are of the best quality and that the work is done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of the construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that the plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through the cracks, leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was completely alone most of the time at the lighthouse and some have said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was acting strange. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by years of solitude and thought that it would be best that he spend some time away from the island altogether. In 1852, Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December in that same lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. Now, the next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper said that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks, except on January 20, 1876. The keeper at the time named Betts reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote that a, a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later, on May 3rd of 1876, Betts wrote that the two men were lost last January have since been seen several times, once from Caney Lighthouse and once from Jacksonport. The men are apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account, they were still adrift there's not much hope that they'll be found and buried. By 1900, most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. In 1910, a successful business owner and inventor, Chester Thordeson, purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. He is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island, he built a giant stone wall that has a boathouse on the lower level. 
A stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. The great hall that was used to store Thordeson's immense book collection was there too. He had over 11,000 books, and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection too. Thordeson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, though some have speculated that he saw something that actually scared him to death. I couldn't find any writings from Thordeson, however, that mentioned him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death, though, multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple of binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thordeson's personal papers are housed in the archive section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin as well. Now, all of this history I gave is just to provide a little bit of context for experiences that I have had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021, I took my first and last trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides, I arrived on the island at about 2pm. I had booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time hiking out to the site to enjoy the scenery and took a couple of breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking to be honest, but I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my campsite, I heard a single sort of high-pitched squeal noise coming from the forest. It didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped at my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds, waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site, and when I got back, I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D, and E are grouped together, but there's probably a hundred yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path now. As I was setting some sticks up on my fire ring, something caught my eye though and I looked up. Fairly far away, it looked like it might have been at maybe site D or a little further, was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well, that's odd, because like I said, it's not even really a trail that they were on. Then my mind just went up to, well, there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose grey clothes, maybe a hoodie. It was still far enough away that I couldn't really make out the details at this point. But I quickly stood up from the crouching position that I was in, and just as I did, I heard that high-pitched squeal noise again. This time it was behind me, and it was much closer. This startled me quite a bit, so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple of seconds, but didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around because I knew the running person must be getting close now, but when I did, they were gone. Again, I stood there and scanned the trees, but... I didn't see them anywhere. I was honestly so confused that I was just kind of frozen for a few seconds. It was all very strange, but I was able to reason it out in my head that it was a, a fellow camper from site C or D that was maybe running to pit the toilet that was a couple of hundred yards west of the sites or something like that. I tried to forget about it, but it really bothered me, I'm not gonna lie. I really did not like whatever that squeal noise was too, and I don't know, I just felt strange all of a sudden. With some effort though, I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple of adult beverages and then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen sites C or D yet, so I thought that I would check those out and see if I did have some neighbors camping nearby or something. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet, so that made me feel a little bit less uneasy about the runner. 
I figured that it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D or something. It didn't make a lot of sense, obviously, because I probably still should have seen them, but it made me feel better. I continued on to Site C and saw that there was a tent up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought maybe I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site and there was a couple sitting at the picnic table. Neither of them looked like they would have been the person that I saw running, but I introduced myself nevertheless and they introduced themselves too. They were probably in their mid-30s and they were really nice too. Both of them seemed to be pretty drunk, but not quite off their face yet, I guess you could say. I didn't ask about the runner in the end or the squealing noises because I thought that that might be weird. And in the end, I just wished them a good night and I walked back to my tent. When I got back, I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at the millions of stars and I felt better about everything from earlier and felt a little bit stupid about the whole thing and decided in the end to just get some sleep. It was a long day and so I fell asleep almost immediately as well. At around 2.30 in the morning though, I woke up to a huge boom of thunder. It started downpouring like crazy. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped and I love camping in the rain but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry a bit. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and the lightning and I didn't feel good about being out there in a tent and felt pretty exposed. The storm lasted for about an hour as well before it became just a sort of light and steady drizzle. I was starting to fall back to sleep too when it was then that I heard that squeal noise again. I opened up my eyes wide in the dark and I just laid there, silent. There was another loud squeal noise and it was pretty close. Now, I knew that there were no real dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bear or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better though, because there was just something about that squeal that it just seemed, I don't know, weird to me. I didn't like it. I say squeal though, because that's the best that I can describe it. It sounded to me a lot like a pig squeal and... While I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or perhaps angry pig squeal. In any case, I continued to lay in my tent and that's when I started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining so the sounds were a little bit buried in the sound of the rain but it definitely sounded like a, a somewhat large animal or human walking around that I sat up in my tent and I took a knife out that I had just to feel better. In my head I just kept saying you know it's just an animal it's fine there's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent. I just sat there being still holding my knife for maybe 10 minutes without hearing anything else. I started thinking to myself it's fine. It's just an animal. You're being stupid and you just need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down too when there was a very loud squeal. And this time, it was right outside of my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. My heart was beating so hard my entire body was pulsing and I felt it in my ears. It took everything in me but I forced out a get out of here... Not shouting, but a stern and mean sounding voice as I could make at that moment. And after that, I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps the rest of the night. But I also didn't get any sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually, the rain stopped and I kept laying there until the sun came up just listening. All that time, I was trying to reassure myself that... I was just being stupid and that it was just an animal. It was probably around 7am before I decided that I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. And as soon as I stepped outside of my tent, I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was now upside down. 
when I saw this, I surprisingly calmly thought, Oh, okay, this is enough. I'm leaving the island today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind must have blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little bit strange because the table was pretty heavy and I felt like I would have heard the table flip over that night, but I made some cold instant coffee and had a bite to eat, started to feel a bit better about the whole thing, and then I decided to go for a hike. I admit too that I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural, but after I had some coffee and food and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I'd heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time to be honest. The reason that I came to the island in the first place was to hike the 7 mile Thordeson's Loop Trail that has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to start the hike today. So I packed a few things in my backpack and I started off. Now, fairly close to my side is the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked like someone had recently had a fire in it. A little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. It's believed that there are still more buried here in the unmarked graves too, but these likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. Now, the island has three cemeteries in total. There's one by the beach and that's where Chester Thordeson is buried. There's one in the eastern part of the island where the two sisters are buried. And there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper, David E. Corbin, is buried too. There is also at least one Native American burial area on the island too, but no one knows exactly where that is. Anyway, I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench where I sat down and drank some water. I started to hear some talking on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick, so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what the language it might have been was and both voices were very, very deep and sort of guttural. Then, back deep in the woods, I heard a loud and quick sort of ooh sound. Immediately, both the voices that I was listening to responded with their own oohs and... I kind of smiled because it sounded like these two heard whatever it was in the woods and they were trying to be funny and mock it by responding. I got off the bench, put my backpack on and I started walking in the direction further down the trail where the voices were coming from. The strangest thing is that I never found those people. That was really weird too because I could have sworn that they must have been on that trail somewhere really close to me. The rest of the hike went very well though. I visited the cemetery where David E. Corbin is buried. I took a self-guided tour of the lighthouse and I passed the wooden gate that apparently used to be part of a larger structure. I walked by the great hall and dock area from where I arrived on the island. I visited some of the other structures on the island too. Came across the cemetery where Chester Thordeson is buried. Then finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a really nice hike with a lot to see and wasn't especially difficult, but by the end of it, I was tired. I did walk down to Campsite C to ask the couple that I spoke with the night before how they did with the storm during the night, but they had packed up and left by this time, so unfortunately I didn't get to talk to them. I was disappointed too, because I really wanted to ask them about the squealing noises during the night as well. Anyway, the rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. I built a fire, made some meals, had a cigar, and I had some drinks. As soon as it got dark though, I was ready for bed since I had so little sleep the night before. So I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep, and I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly again and was immediately fully alert. Nothing that I was aware of caused me to wake up, but I don't know, I just felt like something was wrong. I sat up in my tent and this part is a little hard to explain so bear with me. So a feeling of just complete dread washed over me all of a sudden. It was unlike anything that I'd ever felt before. It felt like there was something in the tent with me and 
I could feel that it was angry, seething with anger, rageful even, and I could feel its hatred for me. It felt like something very bad was about to happen, and I just couldn't do anything about it. I started to shiver uncontrollably, and then there was a, a smell of like garbage or rotten meat, and it got stronger and stronger to the point where I almost threw up, but couldn't because I was just completely frozen. I'd never felt so exposed and helpless apart from that point in my life, and I stared forward at nothing, just frozen, and the weird thing is is that I accepted that whatever was about to happen to me was just going to happen. It was like my brain telling me that whatever is about to happen, even if it is death, will at least be relief. And then, all of a sudden, I just blacked out. At least, I have to assume I passed out because that's all I remember until I woke up at about 10am that morning. Now, when I woke up, I was laying outside of my sleeping bag on top of it and my legs were in a really sort of unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back with my left leg straight out and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart started pounding but I kept thinking to myself that it was a dream. It must have been. But I'm leaving right now. But it was a dream. I packed up everything very quickly and I started back toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island at this point. But since the first boat from Washington Island doesn't arrive until 10.30 in the morning, I had to kill a little bit of time around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get off that island though so bad, but I did feel a little better just being out of the woods, I'll admit, and that I could see other people as well. I sat down on a bench a little to the east of the dock and lit a cigar just to give me something to do while trying not to think about the night before. I was sitting a few minutes and scanning out over the water when I was startled by someone behind me saying hi. I jumped and was really embarrassed when the person came around saying, Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I saw you smoking and just came over to ask if you had a lighter. I felt a bit like an idiot and told him that that was fine. I just didn't sleep well last night and was kind of zoned out and I handed him my lighter. He thanked me, lit a cigar and then handed the lighter back to me. We made some small talk and then started talking about the unusual things that you might talk about. He said that he was from the Madison area. We talked about the storms that we'd been having and he seemed to be a real outdoorsy kind of guy as well and talked about his plans to move to Washington Island. It was a nice normal conversation and kind of took my mind off the night that I just had for a little bit. He seemed like a, a pretty nice guy. Then naturally he asked me what site I had been staying at. I told him that I was staying at site E the last two nights. And he said that he usually books that site but I must have reserved it before him. He said that he had booked site D the last two nights. And I was surprised by this because no tent or anything was at site D the two times that I walked past the site. I told him this and he said that he comes to the island a few times a year and you have to sort of book a site but he actually camps at a different area on the island. I asked him where he camps and he told me that most of the time he camps in the East Cemetery but he also likes to camp in the woods south of the lighthouse. He told me that he hikes about halfway down the Fernwood Trail and just heads north into the woods where he finds a place to camp. He said that one time he found the ruins of a small log house in those woods and he's going to try and find it again and camp inside of it. At this point I started to change my opinion about this guy and I wanted to change the subject but then he asked me if I heard the screeches in the woods and at that I took a second to reply and knew exactly what he was talking about. I told him that I had and asked if he knew what it was. This time he took a second to reply and I saw his face change. He looked as if he was thinking if he should tell me something, almost like a, a secret I guess, but with no expression at all on his face. He just said, matter-of-factly, a demon lives on this island. Now, under any other circumstance, I would have laughed this off for sure, but not after what I had experienced the night before. He looked at me and must have seen the anxiety and the fear that I was feeling. He surprised me by letting out a quick laugh, and then he asked me if I'd saw anything that night. I told him that 
I hadn't seen anything and he stared at me like he was trying to figure something out. I felt like he could tell that I'd experienced something and at this point I was ready for the conversation to be over but then he told me that he had seen something in the cemetery that night. Now his face and mood kind of changed again like he was trying to confide in me. I really did not want to ask the question but I knew that he wanted me to ask it so I asked him what he saw in the cemetery but my voice was shaky. Then I could tell that he had changed his mind about telling me. He actually looked at me with empathy and told me that what he saw was hard to explain but if I was afraid of the screeching noises he didn't think that I should go near the cemetery. I didn't say anything right away but he said four words without any context, keepers of the flame. At that I looked at my cigar and the ash was long. I put it out and told him that I was going to wait by the dock for the boat and he nodded and I started to walk away. After a few steps he said, hey, and I turned around to look at him. He just said, don't come back here, okay? I turned around at that and started walking again. I don't know if that was a, a warning or a friendly suggestion, but whatever it was, I took it to heart. I was definitely not going to come back to Rock Island. When I did get home though, I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things that he could have been referring to in fact. The name of the Native Americans that lived on the island. It could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were sometimes referred to as keepers of the flame. But then there was also a 19th century cult that was said to visit the island from time to time that called themselves the keepers of the flame. I know that hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year and they have a great time camping, hiking the trails and exploring Chester Thordeson's buildings. But my humble suggestion is this. Do not go to Rock Island. It all started about a month ago when a man started banging on my door at six at night yelling for Mike to come out. That he needs to see him and get cigarettes. I told him that he had the wrong house and to leave. There has never been a Mike in this house. He got even more aggressive though calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat the skinny living whatever out of me and I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I've never called 911 before and they didn't even pick up. Looking back, it was stupid but it was instinct but after some more yelling, eventually he leaves. I called my father who was across town to come home and what was going on and he showed up. He called 911 to file a report. The guy came back and started screaming at him though. Cops were called again showed up half an hour after the call and couldn't find him and told me to defend myself if it came to it. I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't think I would feel safe at home. I can be a strong person but I just don't think that I can do much against a, a drugged out man like that. What made the situation even scarier to me though is that as I was going through my driveway camera photos it shows him walking up to my house hours before and I didn't even have any idea about this. I have really bad anxiety so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress but I managed to finally calm down and convince myself that that was the end of it. Come that weekend my father went on a trip with his girlfriend so I was left alone for a couple of days. I just put on a scary movie when I heard screaming again and a loud bang. I pull up my camera and see that He's back, pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and has thrown over our trash can. Again, this guy's screaming for Mike and I call 911 and they show up within minutes this time and are able to stop him down the street. They tell me that there's really nothing that they can do since he hasn't committed a crime yet but if he comes back to call them again and then they'll have more reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks too. And so I again believed that that was the end of it. Until today. This morning my father and I got into an argument so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass every now and then. 
and it was beautiful morning weather. I noticed a truck drive down the left side of the park and turned to the street my back is facing. He waved as he passed, so I did too, thinking that it was just a man going to work. I wanted to show that I was okay, thinking that that might have been what he was asking about. He then pulls off into the right side of the park, stops, makes a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly go off in my head, so I get up to start walking home. I look back and see that he's turned off his headlights and is trailing me. I get to the front of my house and he slows. I get a, a better look at his face this time and it looks like the man that had been harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his red baseball cap, he just glared at me like I took everything in his life away from him. I get to the door and try to barge in but my father put the chain on in anger of me walking out so I had to yell to him that I was being followed and to open the door. He opens it and by then the truck was gone and it was down the street. Now I'm terrified to leave my home. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike but even now I'm scared to do that. I don't know who that man is or what his deal is or what his intentions are, but I live in paranoia just waiting to find out. When I was 16 or 17, I was coming home to Brooklyn from a movie in Manhattan with my friends. I was the only one who lived in BK, so I worked home from the train alone. I was used to being out late by myself. I had midnight curfew, but I frequently broke it because I didn't think nothing bad would ever happen to me. That despite an uptick of assaults and all sorts of stuff in our neighborhood at the time too. This night, however, I was actually slated to get home on time for once. It was the summer after I graduated high school and I was feeling amazing. I had a little to drink and a little to smoke and I felt like I was on top of the world. It was really hot out too and I remember that I was wearing this long sheer cape thing and a very tight and revealing little dress underneath. Not that anything would have probably been different if I'd been wearing shorts and a t-shirt anyway. However, because of my fun little outfit, I was feeling myself and being so stupid, taking selfies while I walked down the dark streets and listening to music with both headphones in, not paying any attention to my surroundings. I think I even sang as I was walking and... I got to my building after finishing my 10 minute walk from the train and walked up the steps to our apartment. We lived in a brownstone with apartments in it and ours was on the third floor. We had a gate at the bottom of the steps separating us from the sidewalk. I pulled out my headphones and began to fumble with my keys at the top of the steps. Just as I had found the correct key, still humming to myself and thinking about my great night, I heard the latch on the gate clank as if it were being opened. I turned around and I saw a man standing at the gate, staring at me. He was young, probably early 20s, wearing a grey hoodie with the hood up, covering part of his face. But I could see his eyes and immediately I knew that something was off because of just how blank yet nervous his expression was. One hand was on the handle of the gate as if he were about to open it completely, but stopped once I turned around. Somehow, my fight or flight instinct didn't kick in yet. It was probably the alcohol, I guess, but I cautiously called down, can I help you? And he didn't respond. I looked him over more closely and realized then that his other hand, the one not on the gate, was moving, fast, low, near his waist. I registered that he was actually touching himself, gasped, and within milliseconds, he was sprinting up the stairs behind me, reaching out his hand to grab me. My brain clicked into place and I started screaming at the top of my lungs as I jammed my key into the door and slammed it behind me. I ran up the stairs to my apartment screaming for my dad, not even stopping to make sure the door was locked, thinking that if he followed me upstairs, he'd soon be met by my very tall father and our very loud dogs too, who slept in the bedroom right next to our apartment door. But as I looked over my shoulder while tearing my way up the stairs, I saw his face pressed up against the glass window, still watching me, but now his eyes looked absolutely furious. I ran into our apartment, still screaming to my parents to call the police. 
My dad went downstairs and looked around, but by that time, he was gone. The police came anyways after my mum called and came upstairs to take my statement so that they could make their report. The two cops who showed up asked me to describe him. I did, and they said that they would cruise around looking for him, and regardless of if he was found, a detective would call me soon to make a more detailed report. But they never actually called me. There were many more sexual assaults and other assaults as well that continued to take place in my neighborhood for the rest of the summer even. And I shudder every time that I think about what would have happened if I hadn't taken out my headphones before I began unlocking that door that day. I don't know how long he was following me for and as far as I know he was never caught either. But from that point on, for those last few weeks before I left for college, I would call my dad and make him meet me at the train station so that he could walk me home safely. Now, as an adult too, I'm far more cautious than I was as a teenager. I'm always extra aware of my surroundings, especially at night, and I don't look at my phone while I walk home either. I don't think that I'll ever get the image of his blank stare as he lunged towards me out of my head and... I'll never forget the feeling of the pit of my stomach as I realized that he followed me home, watching me and touching himself like that, and was now waiting to strike. It was like being a deer realizing that it's being stalked by a tiger, because the tiger accidentally stepped on a twig and gave itself away right before it pounced on its prey. I was extremely lucky that night. So I'm a 21 year old French girl and I'm sorry about my English. I'm also a student in Lille, France. So tired of not finding true love, I decided to lose my virginity with my best friend. Then I found a fantastic hookup friend which I get along with wonderfully on all levels and we were together for about three months. But it was around this time that they then say that they still love their ex. So being fragile as I was, I actually attempted to take my own life. I go to the emergency ward and then the mental hospital as well. For the smart ones among you, you'll have to understand that I was already depressed for a few months. Under treatment is what I mean, with a strong penchant for alcohol as well. And to complete this auto-destruction mechanism, what better way than dating apps, right? So... A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I match up to make some new encounters and I forgot about my dear and tender hookup friend. I always meet guys at their home for a first date because I have zero experience and that's what I did for my very first date too. So one day I match with this guy and let's call him Matthew. Matthew's not a, a very handsome guy and has a few extra pounds but I'm not Beyonce either let's be honest so I match him. We laugh a little bit, we have some common tastes, and he smokes some weed, so I thought, well, perfect. We can plan to smoke, and then we can just, you know, get it on. He gives me some personal information, like his address. No idea if it's the real one, mind you, and his job, or rather, old job, I should say. He just got fired, apparently. But work or not work, to be honest, I just didn't really care at this point. I don't want to do my life with him anyway, it was just a, a quick hookup. So I explained to him that I'm a bit fragile and that I came out of a, a kind of mental clinic, that I'm depressed and blah blah blah. It's all for the sole purpose of making him understand that he shouldn't play with me. I also tell him that I'm looking for just a fun time, but still with some discussion and some hugs and whatnot, and not just a shot in like 20 minutes and it's done sort of thing. He assures me that that is what he is looking for too and that he's actually very cuddly and so I thought perfect. After one or two days of discussion we agreed on a date, a mojito party at my house and he can bring some joints. Matthew arrives and he is not cute at all, even worse than in the photos. He has a dirty look like greasy hair, stained t-shirt... It was like the style of a teenager who didn't know how to dress himself, despite him being 26 years old. In short, I'm far from excited, but I desperately need the company. I offer to make him the drinks while I choose a film on television, and he runs and passes on the kitchen side to prepare two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talk a bit, 
He's not very smart and not very interesting either. I drown in my drink, hoping to animate the party alone. But this is where there is a three-day blackout. So, according to dear Matthew, we would have drunk and smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I vaguely remember being naked on my bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and just slamming the door. My phone is discharging and my alarm clock is not ringing. I'm away from a work group appointment so my friends are worried and they call me. They can't contact me so they contact my sister but she also goes to voicemail. The girls apparently come down from my house and ring again and again but there's no answer. They call the fireman who managed to open the bottom door but not the door to my apartment. They knock on the door calling me and I end up opening the door dressed in a blanket to hide my nakedness. I look at them with just what they described as incomprehension. The firemen conclude that I'm hungover and break up while my friends help me get dressed and whatnot. They also think that I drank too much. But they notice that my body is covered with what looks like yellow betadine on my arms, legs, stomach, etc. I told them that I burned my arm yesterday and that I wanted to heal myself, but there was no sign of a burn or anything on my arm. Besides, I don't even have betadine. They take my cat and take me back to one of their houses since I'm in just a completely comatose state. I have trouble speaking, I look completely elsewhere as anaesthetized, and I even seem to have trouble thinking. The next day, my sister comes to pick me up so that I can stay with her for a few days. Everyone is convinced that I tried to end my life again with drugs or alcohol or something, but I try to tell them that that wasn't the case but I start complaining about pain in the vulva area and blood loss as well. My pill stops my period completely, so my sister takes me to the hospital at this point. I explain to them that there may have been unprotected sex since I was well, pretty much unconscious. There is an AIDS vaccine and stuff that you can get, and I'm advised to file a complaint, and I'm being redirected to the OB emergency room. The next day, I finally regain consciousness gently, and my relatives see it right away. I'm a little bit more lively and my remarks are a, a little bit more consistent. They meet me in the emergency place and I get swabs done and I get a preventative AIDS treatment. And so over the course of a week I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, etc. And I went to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends who met me at home and my sister who took care of me as well. And after talking about it around me to people my age, older people as well, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was more than mentioned. They think that the guy must have chickened out right at the last minute. So despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off and the blood on the doors of my apartment, which was weird right, my attacker apparently got nothing out of me in the end and I'll never know what really happened that night, and I guess what he really wanted too. I would like to point out too that I used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and that never before had happened where I blacked out for like three days. But in the end, I got lucky that night. Thankfully, I didn't have AIDS or any sort of sexually transmitted disease, and also thankfully, I didn't seem to have been sexually assaulted or anything. But I am pretty sure that... He put something in my drink that night, and that he had intentions to take something from me. That I'm pretty confident on. So I feel like now that I'm 23 years old, male, and that I've grown up a bit, I'm starting to feel the gravity of many things that happened, and have happened around me even. Being a curious person, I like to investigate things. I like to make my own theories around them. And yesterday morning, I started having this conversation with my mum about my theories on what dreams actually are and what science says about it. In the midst of that conversation, I suddenly recalled an incident that happened with her many years ago. My mum is not at all a, a person who likes to make things up. She's always really skeptical of superstitions and all that. And I know that if she claims that watching something with her own eyes which freaked her out and almost froze her to death, that she is probably speaking the truth. 
It happened around 12 years ago. My family was going through financial crisis and we used to live in my maternal grandma's house back then. Recently, a thief had been sighted in the house who ran away in panic because of the fear of being caught. Many scary things were happening and we took them all seriously because they were causing all of our family a lot of stress. I didn't get to know exactly when and how, but one evening my mum told my grandma that she saw what she described as a hairy demon in the bathroom and almost froze to death seeing it. As I was a stupid 11 year old kid back then, I took it as a fun horror story and I just let it be. But when I recalled this incident yesterday, I decided to ask about the details with my mum. So I asked her to explain what the appearance of that thing was like. She told me that apparently it was sitting on the floor of our bathroom. She said that it looked like an early man was her words. Told me that it was so gigantic that when it stood up on its legs, he easily reached the ceiling. As she froze and started screaming for help from my dad, this creature took only a couple of really, really long strides and disappeared. But the strangest thing is that she says that she doesn't actually recall many of the details about how this thing actually disappeared. It's almost like she has a memory gap. I asked her why she calls this thing a demon and she said that because that's what her first guess was. I asked, so you mean to say that it looked like a caveman? She said, no, it wasn't a man or a human in the first place. A beast? I asked. In fact, she said that it had very long hair all over its body and the hair had a, a sort of soil-like color to it. And it was at this point, immediately my brain, for whatever reason, said, Bigfoot. Then I googled Bigfoot and showed her the images. And she said that, it was very much of the same appearance as those images. To be honest, I really didn't know what to make of that. I was shocked to hear it. The thing is too is that I'm from India of all places. Nobody ever heard of any Bigfoot in India, let alone in an urban environment. And that too in one's bathroom of all places. As weird and illogical as this incident sounds... Apparently, my mum swears by it, that it really happened. Again, my mum rarely believes in things like this and is always very serious towards stuff like this, so she's never really been attention-seeking or something like that. And this incident never helped her in any way either, so I can't really think of a reason why she would lie about it. In fact, she was facing so many more challenges in life that this incident was a fresh wound on already wounded skin, to be honest. But, I don't know, what do you guys think about this incident? How can one see a Bigfoot-like creature in one's own home, which then just disappears and is never seen again? Could it have been something else? Also, there's a little incident about how my grandma saw it too around the same time, which I'm not including here, but I don't want to make this super long and all that. But that obviously lends credence to my mum's story too. Anyway, thanks for listening, and if you've got any thoughts to share, then I would love to hear it. So my friend lived in a super rural, small country town, and I had come to spend the summer with her at her grandparents' house. We were both about 13 at the time, but we're both 22 now, and thought that it would be a good idea to sneak out and walk around the town, maybe stop by the park. As we were walking down this one road, about 30 minutes after we left the house, we noticed somebody following us, wearing all black with a hoodie. We both got pretty creeped out by it and quickly ran at a corner before hiding in the dark of some bushes. After the guy passed us and we waited about another 30 minutes, we decided that we should probably head back to her house, so we ran there. Once we got back inside, we couldn't really go to sleep, so we did an all-nighter. And the next morning we saw on the news that a woman was stabbed, assaulted, and killed on the exact road that we had been on that night. We couldn't help but wonder if the attacker was the man who had been following us, but safe to say, we never did sneak out again after that.
I had just finished high school and got a summer office job in the city 45 minutes from my hometown. My boyfriend at the time also had a job in the city and would give me rides to and from work. Unfortunately, this meant that I arrived up to an hour, maybe an hour and a half, before the office opened. This was before smartphones, so I'd normally sit and read out from by the fountain, waiting for my office to open. This wasn't the best side of town too. Mostly industrial buildings with a few gas stations and restaurants spread out, all near a major freeway, intersection sort of overpass thing. I wanted to get an apartment closer to work and start community college in the fall. I just couldn't find roommates and my boyfriend said that he'd rather commute to work than pay rent. I decided to go it alone despite my mum's fears of me living by myself. I found a beautiful 1940s brownstone, only a 20 minute walk or 10 minute bus ride to work as well. Being a broke teenager and liking the exercise, I mostly walked to work. I took the same route every day, cutting across a vast parking lot and entering the building from the side rather than using the sidewalk and front door. My office was a rented space in a large 10-story building with other businesses like telemarketing and call center offices. No doctors or lawyers or other businesses that would have in-person customers, so I rarely saw other people in the parking lot or surrounding grounds other than like co-workers or other professionally dressed office workers. But one morning, on my usual route, right before my shortcut, I spotted an adorable little fluffy white dog halfway across the parking lot. I was excited too and wanted to pet her on my way in. I was about to walk directly towards her when my eyes followed her leash up to the person holding her and immediately something just didn't feel right. Time seemed to slow down because it felt like I had so much time to process so many details at once. He was older, maybe 50-ish, tall, large build, white, wearing a baseball cap, dark sunglasses, shorts and a t-shirt. It wasn't even 8 o'clock in the morning at this point and I wondered what he was doing in the parking lot. There was nothing nearby and he wasn't anywhere near the grassy areas. He seemed to be urging the dog in my direction almost, and sort of stowed in by a, a white windowless van that had the back door open. I turned and walked the opposite direction, taking the sidewalk around the front of the building. My office wasn't open yet, so I practically ran up the stairwell to my floor, and for some reason went up to the next landing. I could see the hall through a small window in the door. I waited, heart pounding after a moment, I started thinking that I was just being paranoid. But then, I saw him carrying the dog and trying the doors, which thankfully were locked. Obviously, I was terrified. He checked the stairs next, and feeling stupid for trapping myself when the only way out was down, I couldn't go down without him seeing me, so I went up a few more stairs to hide and waited, and then I heard the door open below me. Adrenaline filled my body as I looked down, only to see a co-worker coming out to smoke. I rushed past them and into the office. I was still on edge, but I didn't want to sound silly, so I didn't mention the encounter. An hour goes by, and I decided that I needed a break, still feeling uneasy. I glanced down the stairwell before heading down. I see him again just exiting the building at this point which means that he was waiting for me the entire time i'm so freaked out at this point that i just run back inside and tell the office manager everything that happened i don't know if she took it seriously but she said that she'd keep an eye out and let others know i also had co-workers drive me home that day and i never took the same route to work ever again I'd leave at different times each day and enter the building from different doors, anything not to be predictable. I never did see the man or his dog again, but I learned a valuable lesson. Always be aware of your surroundings and trust your gut. If you feel like you're in danger, then you probably are.
This happened at the end of the first quarantine, about late July or maybe early August. Ikea had said that they would be accepting a mass of customers and my mother said that she needed to go and get some stuff we had previously not been able to get. At the time I lived with my mother, brother, nan and grandfather. They all get up early so they wanted to go as well. I however wanted to just stay in bed because the line would have been like two hours long. And when the time came for my family to leave the house, my mother came into my room and told me that they were going to Ikea. And I, being half asleep, just sort of agreed with everything and didn't think much of it. But something felt off. I just had this gut feeling as if somebody was standing over me. But now that I think of it, it couldn't have been my mother because I could really hear her outside my door. In any case, they left the house and I was left alone for about four hours. For the first two and a half, I just sort of played on my PS4 with my friend. But I then heard the distinct sound of the front door being unlocked from the inside. But the outside and inside make different sounds. I thought that this was odd because I had one headphone off my ear just to hear when they got home. But it was still creepy how it was clearly being unlocked from the inside. I heard no noise for the next few minutes so I went down to say hello. But the door was still locked and still nobody had got home. After about 10 minutes, I was still playing on the PS4 while telling my friend about it, when I heard my bedroom door open and felt the wind that it normally makes when it opens. I turned, but still there was nobody there. Now though, I was really starting to get freaked out. I thought it might have been from the lack of sleep that I was getting at the time, or just my imagination or something, and nothing happened for the next hour. Because I'm a junk food loving teenager though, I constantly was going downstairs to get drinks and snacks and stuff. But the last time I did it was the part that left me just absolutely terrified. You see, I walked downstairs to get my food and drink. For some reason I always have the feeling that someone is always behind me when I'm going up or down the stairs. And I started to walk back up them. As I reached the top of the stairs, I have to look down a hallway to my left, but I could see my door over the ledge before fully getting up the stairs. And that was when I saw, well, me. At my door, slightly cracked open with me, there, just staring. It had the facial structure of me and the same hair, but the facial features were a little bit different. In any case, that was enough for me. I ran out of the house and didn't go back in until my parents got home. Now, most of you probably won't believe this because I know it sounds like a, a common fake story, but it was there, clear as day, and that's why I'm scared of being home alone now. Too many unexplained things have happened in my house while I'm home alone, and it's left a scar on my brain. But this one, it definitely sticks out. This one was the worst by far. This one is burnt into my memory. My family decided to take a vacation in a zone near the coast in a big cottage. We came there with some friends to spend the weekend and we were without any houses around and like four to five kilometers away from the nearest town. When we first arrived and entered the house, I immediately felt a, a strange sensation from it. I thought it was just uh, being in a place that I didn't know, so I ignored it. But when the night came, everything started to get really weird. So I slept in the same room as my sister, but she was fast asleep, so she didn't realize what was happening. But when I was finally getting to sleep... I suddenly heard three hard knocks on the door, so I instantly get up from the bed and come near the door to see what was happening. I open the door, and there was no one. I thought that it could have been our friends, so I sent them a text message saying that they should stop joking around with us because we're trying to sleep. Anyways, I felt like they wouldn't stop, so I waited close to the door until I heard another knock, and I was going to try and catch them in the act. 
But then I received a text message from one of my friends saying that they were in the upper room trying to sleep too, so they don't know what I was talking about. I decided to stay near the door anyway, just in case, but maybe they were lying. And suddenly, another violent knock sounds again, so I immediately open the door just to see that there was nothing. Neither my friends nor anyone else. In that moment, I knew something was happening in that house. I tried to sleep, but my head was trying to understand what the heck was going on. The next day, I talked about this to my parents, and they said that we could move to another room in the upper floor, but didn't actually believe me. I mean, I was 14 at the time, so they just thought that it was my imagination. But then the night came again, and I was ready. I thought that if something happened again, i will wake up my sister so that she could confirm it later too. The hours passed and I was in bed with a little light turned on when suddenly I started to hear strong hits. But this time they didn't come from the door. Instead, they were coming from the wardrobe next to us. I immediately woke up my sister and she was terrified too. The hits didn't stop and the violence of them was so hard that the door from the wardrobe was actually moving like something was trying to get out of there. I said that I would try to open it to see what was trapped inside and my sister was begging me not to do it because she was absolutely in shock. But anyways, I open it and in that same moment, the sounds just stopped. It just became completely silent in the room. It was at this point that she decided to wake up our parents because she was afraid that this thing was there to harm us somehow. It was an awful situation and we never did go back there again after that. I don't know what happened that night, but it's definitely something that will stick with me forever. This happened about eight years ago in August of 2013. I was camping in far north Queensland, Australia in a place called Barron Falls, which is northwest of Cairns. I, a 21-year-old girl, was camping with my two male friends, who were backpacking from Estonia with Theo and Charlie. Where we set up camp was not an official campsite. Rather, we walked along the tourist path, climbed over a railing, followed a train track for a few kilometers, and eventually veered off onto the Nance Forest, downhill to a river. It certainly wasn't easy to get to this area, and there wasn't any mobile phone service, but Theo knew about it from friends who had shown him previously. The site was beautiful. We were surrounded by a tropical forest, and were only a short walk upstream from the waterfall. After setting up camp, we walked to the waterfall, where both Theo and Charlie plunged from the cliff into the water below. I decided not to follow. I was and still am scared of heights, and the possibility of hurting myself just wasn't alluring. I sat and watched them for a while before eventually decided to return to camp and read my book. I was totally relaxed too, enjoying the serenity, taking in the beauty around me. What had been an exciting, adventurous day was then interrupted though by a deep, sinister laughing coming from the forest surrounding our campsite. Instantly alerted, I felt chills run through my body as I scanned the forest, trying to detect where the laughter had come from. But there was nothing. I sort of tried to forget about it, convincing myself that my mind must have been playing tricks on me. Theo and Charlie returned and told me that they had forgotten fire lighters for the campfire. They said that they would need to travel to the nearest store to buy some and that I should wait at camp. I told them that I didn't feel comfortable staying at the camp, but didn't mention the laughter that I'd heard before. I didn't want them to think that I was stupid, or for context, at the time I had quite a large crush on Charlie. Stupidly, I wanted him to think that I was cool. They told me that it would be fine and that they would be back before dark. So, reluctantly, I agreed and let them go. It was about 4pm now and I continued reading my book. I began to think back about it, and I realized that the walk back to the car was maybe about 20 or 30 minutes, so they would be gone for well over an hour. At this time of year, dusk would be at 5.30, or maybe a little bit after that, and I would therefore likely be alone in this remote area in the dark. 
I distracted myself with my book, but as dusk began to settle, I struggled to read the pages and fear began to set in. After about an hour as well, I swear that I could hear footsteps in the forest. My first thought was that Theo and Charlie had returned, and I was instantly relieved that I was no longer alone. I listened for their voices, but heard nothing. At that, my heart dropped, because it dawned on me that it may not be then. I started to panic. Then came the laughter, the same deep, sinister laughter that I'd heard before. Only this time, it seemed much closer. I sprung to my feet and surveyed the forest. And that was when I saw him. He was standing on the other side of the stream, which was connected to the river, standing on a log. And what I saw was absolutely bizarre. He was wearing a, an immaculate tuxedo with a top hat and everything. I remember being puzzled as to how he was able to get to this area in such clean formal clothes. And I at first thought maybe he was an apparition or that I was hallucinating or something. I did a double take and I wasn't. I then studied the man's face. It's hard to describe, but he appeared to have suffered from severe burns and had deep scarring covering his face. His hair was shoulder length, very wiry and unkempt. He laughed, that same laugh that I'd heard from the forest. It had definitely come from him. We stared at each other for what felt like minutes. I had planned to sprint into the forest if he charged at me and observe that small creek between us would at least slow him down. He then asked, what are you doing here, all alone, with a really unsettling smile on his face. Luckily, I was able to remain calm and told him that I was camping with my male friends and that they went to get some supplies but would be back soon. The man laughed again. He asked me how long we would be there for and I lied and said that we were leaving the next day. It seemed as if this man wanted to provoke a reaction out of me or something, that he wanted me to panic and run and that he wanted to chase me, but I remained calm and acted as if we were having a standard conversation, and I think this confused him. Miraculously, I heard Theo and Charlie's voices approaching. The man seemed alarmed at this and said that he saw somebody else camping upstream and that he was going to check on them. He left, and minutes later, Theo and Charlie returned. I immediately told them what happened and they laughed and thought that I was making it up, that it was a lame attempt to scare them. Tears began to gather in my eyes and Charlie realized that I was serious. Theo didn't seem phased. He was a very stereotypical backpacker and had the carefree nature travelers tend to have. Charlie, however, assured me that I would be okay and had me sleep between him and Theo for the next two nights. I barely slept at all for those nights. I kept listening for the laughter, but fortunately, I never heard it again. For years after, I searched online for any reports of similar encounters, and I never found anything. But I've always contemplated what would have happened if Theo and Charlie hadn't returned at that moment. I shudder at the thought. I would love to hear what you guys think about this man's intentions and if I was right to be terrified. I haven't been camping since and I don't plan on going again, which maybe that's the really sad part about this whole story is that it just ruined camping for me. So I, a 27-year-old female, was home completely alone and sleeping in my bed in the middle of the night last night. I was woken up by the sound of someone trying to push up on my locked bedroom window. I couldn't see the window because it was past my footboard on the other side of the bedroom and I was laying down, but I knew that unmistakable sound of the window being locked and the jiggling sound that it makes because I've locked myself out plenty of times and have tried to get through that window before. I sat up to get a look and I saw a, a dark silhouette of a person looking in the window. I quickly laid back down for a second, really confused and tired. And when it actually clicked what I had seen, I sat right back up, but they were gone. I tried to get back to sleep, but was spooked for the rest of the night. In the morning, I, I thought
thought that I might have dreamed it after I called everyone I knew that it possibly could have been, and nobody knew anything. Nobody was at my house. Nobody I knew would just try to get into my bedroom window in the middle of the night anyways, especially when I don't think this person even knocked on the front door before trying to open the window. I went outside to investigate at some point to see if I was just going crazy. I looked at the window and there I saw the handprints of whoever was trying to slide up on the glass. Also, it had rained so I could see muddy shoe prints going to and from my window. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted but I'm so glad that my window was locked that night. Okay, so first off, I totally understand if no one believes this because, well, we're still unsure of what actually happened, but we sat down and came to a consensus on the events and all agree that we witnessed the same thing. Me and three buddies were hiking Thursday and Friday in SBNF, various trails, mostly the known ones and mostly during the day. Friday, we were making our way to Clark's Summit. As we were walking, one by one, we noticed that we were veering off the trail. I asked my friend in front of me why he was going off the trail, and he asked our friend who was in front of him the same thing. The friend in front of us told us, I can hear a woman talking. You guys don't hear that? Well, we didn't hear anything. We tried to convince her to just leave it be because it was already kind of dark and we were close to where we wanted to set up camp on the trail. The friend in front is a female and insisted that what she heard sounded like a female calling for help and that she sounded really close so I think she felt inclined to investigate a possible female in distress while we were totally okay with going about our business. So... I get a bit spooked now because she's absolutely serious and we absolutely could not hear whatever she was hearing. But here is where it gets really weird. We only ventured off the trail about maybe 300 to 400 meters, yet at one point we were completely lost. We don't have any fancy gear or GPS stuff because we've never needed it, but we've been on this trail enough to know that we hadn't gone too far. Yet, we couldn't find the trail in any direction after walking for about 15 to 20 minutes. I started to feel weird, kind of dizzy and lightheaded, and when I mentioned this to the other two, they said that they felt weird as well. It was like, I don't know, like something had changed the environment around us, or moved us somehow to another location. I know that sounds weird, but it's the only way that I can describe it. I had no idea which way to go and now it was completely dark. My female friend said the woman's voice had said, I'm over here and please help me. She said that it sounded like she was hurt and crying. So here we are, somehow lost and after only walking for about 20 minutes off a large trail because my friend is hearing voices that we can't hear. We decided to stop walking in any direction because the last thing you want to do at night is get even more lost. We had two tents and sleeping bags in our packs so we found a clearing and we set up. We figured that once the sun was out we'd easily find our way back to the trail. But before we could even lay down to rest I noticed a tree near us was moving as if something was climbing it. It was really dark and I wear glasses so I really struggled to see so I called them over to see it because I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Either that or I thought that it was maybe an animal at first. But it wasn't an animal. It wasn't anything in fact. I could sort of see the outline of what roughly looked like a human shape but it was transparent. Like completely see-through. The best way that I can describe it is the way heat waves look on the pavement in the summer. You know that sort of wavy or liquid effect? That sort of thing. And they saw it too. My male buddy said, what are you looking at? When he finally spotted it. And they all said the same thing. It was transparent but still visible due to the foliage around it being displaced and moving as it moved. And we just 
all stood stone still, whispering theories back and forth as to what we thought that we were seeing. I thought maybe it was some kind of an optical illusion, but they both immediately jumped to aliens, of course. Whatever it was, though, the thing just sat there, perched on a large branch about 50 feet up. In fact, it was almost like it was watching us watching it. The other oddity, too, is that after staring at this thing for about 10 minutes, we noticed all the normal forest sounds that we had heard prior had stopped, like completely. I mean, the only noise was us talking and the leaves under our feet. The hairs on my neck stood up and I had goosebumps all over when I realized this too, because something just felt truly wrong. After about 10 minutes of us just standing there, I guess, whatever this thing was, started to climb up the tree even more until we could no longer see it. We approached the base of the tree slowly and walked around in a circle with our necks craned up, trying to see this thing. It was too dark though, and the trees were just too close for us to see the top. But we didn't hear it jump to another tree, so we assumed that it was still up there. We were all too spooked to obviously camp right underneath whatever this was, so we gathered our stuff and we started walking towards the moon. And I kid you not, after about five minutes of walking, we were instantly back on the trail. I literally dropped my bag and said, what the heck, out loud. We all stood there, confused, looking around trying to confirm what we were seeing. My buddy likes to joke and said that maybe we walked through some like hallucinogenic spores and had imagined the whole thing. I highly doubt that, but whatever happened, it seemed kind of, I guess, predatory is the best word for it. Like, it seems like something was luring us or trying to confuse us. My friend still thinks that we were messing with her about not hearing the woman, that she claimed to be hearing that whole time. But was it that thing that we saw, imitating a woman? How did we get lost so close to the trail like that? This was easily the weirdest thing that I've ever experienced in the wilderness. Well, we still don't have a good theory as to what we saw, too. It may not have been an alien, I guess, but whatever it was... It was definitely humanoid, and was 100% transparent, somehow, and able to climb a really large tree with ease, without making much noise too. Anyway, I would love to hear any theories about what this may have been, because it has all of us completely stumped. Has anyone else seen anything like this in the woods? And if you have, what do you think it was? When I was a baby, my parents bought an old house in a historical society that used to be a toll house way back in the day. It's approximately 315 years old, but I think that I'm lowballing it. I had never felt completely safe in that house too for the 25 years that I lived there. And when I was a kid, I just thought that it was normal to just always feel like you were being watched and to feel something hanging on your back. I wasn't allowed to go over to people's houses or have anybody over until I got to around middle school. I remember going to a friend's normal modern house when I was 12 and immediately feeling safe and private. I didn't feel eyes burning into me. It was so strange to feel that too and I remember dreading going home. I didn't fully click though that my house was odd until friends came over and they said that my house was creepy. I remember going to the bathroom while they were waiting in my bedroom. My dad was asleep in bed and my mum was in her office working, one floor and several rooms adjacent away. I came back from the bathroom and they had asked me who I was talking to. I said, I wasn't talking at all, I was in the bathroom. And I remember one friend telling me that she heard two women whispering just outside my door. She thought that I was talking to my mum or something. And that moment really chilled me. They were afraid to sleep in my room after that and ended up staying awake all night. I remember most nights too when I would go to bed it would feel like a, a man was watching me through my window. I slept on the second floor. But it felt like there would be somebody standing on the roof watching me even though I, 
I know that there was physically no way that anybody could be up there. I begged my mum for years to get curtains, but she refused. She refused to put any curtains up in the house, and I always felt watched from the roof in the backyard. I eventually put up blankets to feel safe, but I still felt eyes burning into me. We had a decently furnished basement, though, where my brother and I had all our video game stuff, and any time that I brought friends down there, they would always ask to go back upstairs instead, but never said why. I grew to love and hate the basement, as it was a respite from my mother, but then I would have to deal with the door opening and shutting by itself, as well as feeling hands on my ankles from time to time if I tried to nap. I remember one time asking my brother if he ever experienced that, and he said that he would often feel a sensation of a hand by his feet, but ignored it because it was that or deal with my mother. I'm not going to get into that can of worms, but... Yes, we preferred being terrified instead of dealing with our mother. Anyway, it soon became a bit of a running joke not to go into the basement unless you wanted to get grabbed. And it became normal to just feel, well, really uncomfortable down there at all times. Not many things happened to me physically at that house. Almost always it was feelings of being watched or seeing a figure in my peripheral only to turn and nothing be there. There are a few more things of note that I can think of now, and one is that there were regularly footsteps in my parents' bedroom, but unlike everything else that happened in that house, this was actually kind of comforting. In the summer, we would sleep on my parents' floor because it saved on the AC. I would stay up very late on my Game Boy while my parents slept, but frequently, the sound and the feeling of footsteps would go by me on the floor. This was when I was very young, and... It was just a normal thing, I suppose, and they made me feel safe, to be honest. Like whoever was walking around was making sure everything was alright. Even as I got older and would sit in the room directly below, if I heard the footsteps up there while my parents were in the other rooms, I kind of felt at ease and like whoever was up there wanted me to know that they were there. Also, we had quite a large backyard, about an acre of land, and it was really pretty, but... I would often have terrifying nightmares of it most nights. I would have bad dreams about people dragging me out there or wild animals attacking me while figures watched. I honestly believed people may have died out there. I stayed out of the backyard as much as possible when I lived there and those dreams plagued me for years. The last thing that I can think of off the top of my head was when I was in senior year of high school. My mum and I were really at odds as I was the only child left in the house. She kept asking me to sleep on the floor in the living room. At this point in my life she slept on the couch and my dad slept in the bed because he genuinely snores so loud she couldn't take it. I really didn't want to sleep in there with her. The living room has four large windows, two facing outside and two facing the backyard and I hated it. But... I reluctantly agreed, and I remember her leaving the TV on and some animal channel when she fell asleep, I think. I was laying there on the floor on my phone when, suddenly, I felt a full hand, palm and fingers, lay on the back of my head and very quickly shove my head down into the pillow. I can assure you as well that the only people home were my mum, myself, and my dad. I could hear my dad snoring upstairs, and my mum was five feet away on the couch. Obviously, I was utterly terrified and I yelled stop and hid under my pillow in fear. My mum freaked out and had no idea what was going on. I was too afraid to move. She didn't believe me when I told her what happened and I remember going back up to my bedroom and praying to whatever God would listen to keep me safe from whatever had done that. I could still feel the phantom sensation of that hand and I remember basically never going into the living room ever again after that, unless it was daytime and somebody else was with me. The older I got though, the less safe I felt in that house. I eventually isolated myself to my bedroom when I wasn't at school or work, but I couldn't fall asleep until 8 or 9 in the morning and I just felt always watched. I started buying white and black candles from the local pagan store as they told me that white was to promote positive energy and black was to protect my mind. You can imagine that 
after 25 years of really weird stuff and feeling unsafe, I was willing to try anything to keep me feeling somewhat sane. And it helped. A lot. But maybe it was just placebo. Who knows? Now, I live in an apartment far away from that house and experience zero paranormal things. I don't feel watched, I don't feel scared, I don't have nightmares, and I finally feel safe. I hate going there to visit my parents, and sometimes I do, and it always brings back so many memories. So I was a security guard for this local company in my area. I was assigned to a water park with another guard who was uh, regularly there keeping watch. He was to train me and show me around and tell me what codes open what doors and stuff like that. But I first noticed how quick he was to enter and leave the property that he never wanted to spend more than like 10 minutes inside the property before he would be eager to leave. Our first night was simple. There was nothing exciting or interesting going on so our night dragged a bit. After a few hours, I asked him if he'd experienced anything unusual while working here. He told me that he's had some problems with people trying to enter the property without permission, but that's about it. He also told me that he hated working there because of his encounters with these people. He said that they creeped him out because of just how sneaky they were. He didn't really want to tell me much because he was afraid that I would leave the post. That should have been a red flag for me, but... I was too excited to let anything like that scare me. A few more hours later and our shift is over so we check out and go home for the day. The next night my boss calls me to explain that the security guard, my partner, had resigned. I must admit that I was a little bit upset about that because now I have to work a two-man post all by myself with barely any knowledge on the place. Anyway... Fast forward a few weeks, I started to get the hang of things and created my own routine with no issues at all. There were no break-ins, no vandalism, nothing. It's now 2am and I was outside at the front of the property completing my rounds when I heard a door slam from inside. I jumped because of how loud it was and as I started to walk back into the property, I continued to hear doors opening and closing. I could feel myself getting nervous because it was my first situation that I've ever had at this place. As I walk inside and started to check the doors and complete around to make sure that there was no one on the property, I get to this corridor where there was a set of stairs that led down to a door that was wide open. I gingerly walk down the stairs to close and lock the door because I was too scared to take a look inside. But as I turned around to head back up the stairs, I noticed a man dressed in all black standing at the top of the stairs. I take a step back and realize that I'm cornered and if he was to try anything I would have nowhere to run or hide. So I politely ask him if he needed any help and he didn't reply. I then ask him how he got into the property. He still didn't reply. He slowly turned his head and snapped his fingers and then from the left side of the staircase, another man slowly crawled to his side like a dog on all fours. And at that, I turned around and kicked the door open and ran inside and locked myself in a bathroom. I did this as I called my boss and told them what I'd witnessed. They sent an armed security guard to my position to complete a walkthrough to make sure that I was safe. As I got the call that the area was clear, I came out and told them everything from start to finish. I realized that they didn't believe me, so... I clocked out and went home for the night. The next morning I received a call from my boss explaining that they had checked the security footage from the night before and what they told me horrified me. Every hour when I would complete my rounds inside the property, those same two men would follow me through the facility as if they were stalking me, like as if it was a game to them. After that I asked for a new position because I was too horrified to work at that water park. I now know why my trainer didn't want to work there anymore too. And this actually happened to me. I have more creepy stories like this from when I was working security. So if you want to hear them, I'd be happy to share them. But thanks for listening and 
It's good to finally get this off my chest. This happened a few years ago when I was just days shy of my 30th birthday. I was returning to the office in the middle of the afternoon after a not so quick trip to the DMV to renew my driver's license. At the time, I worked for a major corporation that was headquartered in downtown. The company has several parking garages, but unless you're a director or above at the company, you have to park several blocks from the headquarters. So, I had just left one of our parking garages about a block and a half away from my office when I heard someone begin walking behind me. Now mind you, this is a major city with a bustling downtown, so obviously nothing out of the ordinary there. I assumed it was just most likely a fellow employee. That is, until I glanced at the ground behind me. This employee was wearing athletic socks tucked into slip-on Adidas sandals, so definitely not an employee of a Fortune 10 returning to the office or anything. I picked up my pace, and so did he. We had recently had several violent attacks on our employees by homeless people, so my company had stationed dozens of police officers and security guards around our campus as a precaution. I quickly made my way across the crosswalk to the courtyard, where they had all congregated, hoping to catch their attention as this person behind me closed in on me. But not a single one took notice. They were just completely oblivious. So the person behind me followed me into the building. At this point, I'm not too nervous. If his intention was to mug me, he'd have to be really stupid doing so while surrounded by police and security guards in a corporate headquarters building. But we have a Starbucks in our lobby that's always packed in mid-afternoon, so knowing that he'd have no opportunity to make a move on me with so many people around, I made my way into the coffee line. I finally mustered the courage to turn around, and when I did... He was gone. There, see? I told myself. I just wanted to make off with my bag, but now he's gone. After 15 minutes of waiting on my coffee, I began making my way back out of the Starbucks. But there's this tiny little nook too that's out of eyeshot of the waiting line, and as I passed it, I saw a pair of socks tucked into Adidas sandals. And when I walked out, he resumed his pursuit. That was the moment that my blood ran cold as well. He wasn't looking for just any target. He'd chosen me. He was determined to finish the job. About 20 feet ahead of me was our security desk. On either side of the security desk are sets of three security turnstiles, which only open with an employee badge or when opened by a security guard. Once again, I tried desperately to make eye contact with the security guard. She was on another planet though. And I basically sprinted through the turnstile, and once I'd made it safely to the other side, I turned around to face my pursuer. He was a kid, no older than 17 or 18, Hispanic with a fade haircut. He had a small tattoo above his left eyebrow, a sleeve of tattoos upon his right arm, black pants and a baggy red t-shirt. Despite everyone around, he stood his ground at the turnstile and... Then he pushed on the glass gates, and pushed again. I shot a look at the security, and she was still clueless, but it was the metamorphosis of facial expressions on the kid's face that scared me the most. At first, it was blank. Is he on drugs, I asked myself. But it was quickly replaced by something else. It was fear. He looked genuinely terrified, like he didn't succeed in getting to me. Something bad was going to happen to him for sure. He pushed on the gate once more. His look of terror evolved into a look of sheer determination. I walked behind the wall separating our elevator banks from our security desk and walked to the other set of turnstiles, where I noticed an unoccupied security guard. On the other side, the kid mirrored my movements though. Ma'am, I told the guard. This kid just followed me from the parking garage, into headquarters, into and out of Starbucks, and just attempted not once, not twice, but three times to force open the turnstiles. And no one noticed. At this point, I was shaking with fear, so she assured me that she'd notify our officers to force him out of the building. 
when I went upstairs and told a colleague what had happened. She told me that I'd need to file a report with our company's asset protection. I think ex-military, security, police, those types. So I did. And a few hours later, I got a call from one of the higher-ups in asset protection. A former Secret Service member and the guy who provides personal security to our CEO. He insisted on walking me to my car that evening too. The following day, around the same time of the afternoon the kid followed me the day before, I got a text from my new friend in the asset protection. And it was a photo of the kid. It read, is this your guy? And I said, yeah, where is he? He said, sitting right outside the entrance of the headquarters, He's 18 years old and has several gang tattoos. He asked, when he followed you, did he say anything? Any catcalling, chirps, anything of the sort? I said, no, he just followed me. He never said a thing. Why? Is that bad? He asked me to call him, so I did. I learned what gang he was based in on the tattoos, which I won't reveal here for safety reasons. I learned I was clearly targeted and that the fact that he said nothing to me implied that his intent, whatever it was, was clearly very bad. He then asked to have me to put my manager on the phone and told both of us that I needed to stay away from the headquarters for at least a few weeks until they deemed the situation safe again. So for the next three weeks I worked out of my stepdad's office. Because we didn't know if the gang kid had targeted me at the DMV or after I had already parked downtown, we also didn't know how much he knew about me. So I was told to stay at my parents' house until it was safe to return. My husband and I had just moved into our new house, by the way. But what gets really interesting is that my stepdad happens to be in intelligence as well. And after he and his colleagues did some digging... It turns out that this particular gang had recently gotten heavily involved in human trafficking of all things. I asked one of my stepdad's colleagues why they targeted me. Weren't younger girls usually a target? Granted, I, I did look quite a bit younger than 30. He then told me that the price for someone my age could be sold for and I felt sick. After three weeks, the kid finally disappeared, but not without some intimidating persuasion. He apparently showed up once more during my absence. We learned that he occasionally rode with his dad to go pick up his little brother at the charter school down the road. His dad would go inside the school for 20 or 30 minutes every day, so they think the kid had someone nearby assigning him tasks or whatever the terminology is. I'm clearly very unfamiliar with that world. But on that day, three weeks before, I was that task. So one day, my stepdad's colleague, also ex-secret service, sat on a bench waiting for him to show up. When the kid's dad went into the school, my stepdad's colleague, who's 6'7", stood up, walked straight up to the passenger window where the kid was sitting, smiled, took out his phone and snapped a photo of the kid's face before walking away. Apparently, the kid lost it, asking, who are you, why did you do that, man, and stuff like this. The kid never came back after that day. It was easily the scariest three weeks of my life, not knowing if this gang member had simply developed a very aggressive crush on me or if his intentions were much, much more sinister. The one good thing that came out of it all, though, is that asset protection moved me into the director and above parking garage, which had an underground entrance to our office, which means that I never had to walk those crazy downtown streets alone ever again after that. Me, my best friend, her girlfriend, and my boyfriend were walking home from dinner and stopped at a 7-Eleven. My boyfriend wanted a couple of beers. We waited outside while he got what he needed. As we were outside, I noticed a girl with a backpack walking around the parking lot. She walked up to another girl who was on her phone, and girl number two said to whoever she was talking to, Yeah, my home girl here, one second, and proceeded to tell girl one to go and sit in a car occupied by a large white male while she went inside. I noticed the male and the girl number one kept looking at us from the car while girl number two stayed on the phone inside. 
I specifically noticed that the male said something and pointed, and girl number one laughed while looking at us. Here's where it gets sketchy too. Girl number one gets out of the car and comes up to my friend and asks her if she has a pen and a paper. She told her that she has a pen but no paper, and we didn't have any either. And here's how the conversation went after she received the pen. Girl number one said, where do you live? The trailer park behind here? Uh, no, but nearby. Girl number one said, oh okay, well my grandmother lives there. Where do you work? My friend said the name of a work girl and she said, oh really, I know that place. My sister used to work there. What's your name again? You look familiar. My friend tells her her name. She says, oh yeah, I think I know you. I knew you looked familiar. My friend has never seen her before, mind you. The girl says, so how far until you're home? At this point, my boyfriend came out of the store. The moment that he did, the girl instantaneously wrapped up the conversation and quickly retreated back to the car saying, well, thanks for the pen, not even returning it. Nor did she write anything the entire time. She also kept trying to touch my friend. I did notice that, specifically at her wrists. The girl also had a hospital band on and was saying that she had depression or something. I noticed the man watching the entire interaction and said something to the girl the minute that she opened the car door. He seemed sort of frustrated with her maybe. But they watched us until we walked off maybe a minute or two later. They proceeded to sit in the car for at least three minutes. At least that's how long it took until they were out of my sight. Probably longer since they made no effort to pull off. But the whole thing just seemed, I don't know, really sketchy and weird. Has anyone heard of anything like this before? I'm especially worried as my friend doesn't have a car and walks everywhere, so there's a good chance that she may be back there at some point. Should we be worried? In the late fall of 2019, my mum decided to leave our narcissistic and emotionally abusive stepfather. She, my younger brother, and I packed our stuff up into a U-Haul and took it all to a new apartment that we'd be living in. It was like a breath of fresh air getting out of that house and into a place away from that man. For the first couple of months, everything was going normally. My mum would go to work, my brother would go to school, and I went to an alternative school that only required me to go like two days a week. This meant that I got a lot of time home alone, something that I'd eventually come to hate. So it started off small. One day I heard the front door open. It was about the time my mum and our brother got home so I went downstairs to see who it was. The door was wide open and nobody was home though. I checked the parking lot and my mum's car wasn't there. My brother was nowhere to be found either and so... I closed the door, went back upstairs after making sure nothing was missing, and that was it. The most common occurrence when I was home alone were the footsteps though. If I was upstairs, I would hear someone walking around downstairs. If I was downstairs, I'd hear someone walking around upstairs in my room. It was almost like a daily thing, so eventually I just stopped trying to investigate and only once did the footsteps come into the same room as me. My bed was against a wall and I was laying face down facing that wall, just scrolling on my phone. It was around 3.50pm and I'd heard footsteps on the stairs. It was about the time that my brother got home every day from school so I didn't think too much of it. But the steps came into our room, we had to share one, and stopped right next to my bed. So I rolled over to see what he wanted. When I did, there was no one there. A few minutes after that, I heard my brother open and close the front door and start up the stairs. And it couldn't have been him the first time because there's just no way that he would have been that quick. But the worst thing that happened was on this one night. Everyone in the house was sleeping except for me and as I was laying in my bed, my eyes were drawn to the far corner of my room right next to my bedroom door. Now, I don't really know a, a good way to describe it other than saying that it was way too dark in that corner. 
Like there was just a, a black hole in the room or something. Every time I looked into that corner as well, I nearly had a panic attack, but I managed to pull my eyes away several times, only for them to be drawn back to the same spot. And there were voices too. They were all whispering indistinctly, but they sounded angry and hateful. It was the most terrifying night of my life, and I think the worst part is that nobody believed me. I got the classic response that it was just the house setting, or that it was just the pipes. I guess it doesn't really matter anyways. Shortly after, my mom, brother, and I left and moved into another house, not for the ghost-related reasons or anything. And... I haven't had another experience since then, which I am very, very grateful for. So this is a story that took place in the late 70s or early 80s. So I was roughly six when this happened, I guess. My parents went on a weekend trip and returned to their home. It snowed while they were gone. This is important for later. And when they entered their home, they noticed things were tossed and moved about. It became clear to them that someone had invaded their house while they were gone. As they looked around, they began to notice that nothing was actually taken. My grandpa had a safe in the spare room, which they found opened. There was cash and jewelry nearby, but again, none of it was taken. They kept important documents in that safe, and... They noticed that their marriage certificate was missing of all things. Still confused, my grandpa made his way to the back door, which was partially opened. He opened it, and when exiting, you step on a sort of back porch, which extends to a large open backyard. And he noticed prints in the snow immediately. It's as though they exited the back door and walked into the yard. He also noticed that the prints didn't appear human. They resembled hoof prints, but seemed human in size. They lived in Illinois, and they've only had small animals like maybe squirrels or deer and raccoons in the area, so definitely not animal prints. And he followed the tracks out to the backyard, where they completely stopped right in the middle. Their yard was fenced in, but the prints completely ended as if whatever this thing was just broke into their home stole their marriage certificate and completely disappeared while walking or flew away. Grandpa was always a no-nonsense World War II veteran. My grandma was the same, never the type of people to play pranks or even joke about anything. But to see them so baffled and scared was something that always stayed with me. We drove to their home later that day with my dad. They lived in a smaller or one-floor home. Dad took a letter and went up to the roof to find some clues, but he found prints up there too. The marriage certificate? That was never found, but they eventually moved from the home. They lived in four other homes in that general area and experienced other things as well. In fact, it was sort of like it followed them. At one of their homes, they heard their doorbell ring at 3am. They woke up and Grandma opened the door to see a black figure that appeared human but was completely see-through. She screamed and quickly shut the door. Grandpa quickly grabbed a fireplace poker and swung open the door and this thing just totally disappeared. In the short amount of time that he opened the door too, this figure, if it was human, couldn't have gone too far. And there really was just nowhere for anyone to hide there, so that one really perplexed all of us. When my father grew up, he also experienced a lot of strange things, but I may share them another time, and this whole thing has just been a, a real mystery for our family for a long time, and if you've got any theories about what any of this could be, then I would love to hear it. This morning, I just got out of class and was headed home. I saw a crippled old lady begging for help along the way and telling me that she needed to get into her apartment. I helped her and took an elevator and took her up to her door. And to my surprise, the door was wide open. When I just sort of edged my way inside, she asked if I could go to a nearby shop to buy her wine and some cigarettes. 
She then proceeded to give her credit card to me and keys and insisted on the fact that I should leave my bag in her house. I said no thank you and even though the situation was really weird, it wasn't that that actually scared me the most. It was the inside of the apartment. You see, there were no decorations, pictures or anything. It was completely disgusting. There was some kind of chair with excrements on it and the walls were filled with cracks. At that, I got scared and took the card and the keys, tried to act normal, and then I wanted to test to see if the card was actually real. I went to the store and the woman said that the card, it was a fake. It was at this moment too that I decided to not go back to her house and gave the keys and the cards to the police. A friend of mine told me that she saw the exact same old lady saying the exact same things that she told me. And the scariest thing is that she saw a man bring her outside and immediately go straight back inside the apartment. The area where she's from is known for being dangerous. There was recently a shooting between drug dealers and daylight, for example. And while I can't be completely sure, I think I may have just nearly died or something. What do you guys think? This is something that happened to me almost a year ago. I was 17 at the time and I was not prepared for the terrifying encounter that I would soon be a part of. A few years ago, me and my family moved from our neighborhood home to a farmhouse in the middle of hayfields and woods to take care of my now past great grandfather who lived there. Since I was such an imaginative kid and loved being outside, I would spend all day out in the fields and the woods, every single day, and I've still done it for all the years that I've lived here. To give you an idea of the layout of this farmland as well, our house is in the front hayfield, then there are two more behind it with a creek running through and finally a couple of miles of woods behind all of that. Keep in mind that these fields are absolutely huge, like it's just hundreds-ish of acres. Anyway, it was evening and I went out to the backfield to watch the sunset, as I usually did. The view was best from there and the sunset always looked cool over the trees. I took the 15-ish minute walk on the gravel road that connects all of our land, through the gates, over the creek, past the pond and finally onto the backfield. I watched it set over the trees until I couldn't get a view of it anymore. It was starting to get dark so I decided to go back home. That was until I saw something. You see, at the other side of the field, right across from me, I saw what looked like a buck staring right at me. And while it's not completely abnormal to see a deer out there, it is odd that it didn't get spooked by me being out there. Since my mum hunts in these woods, I got my phone out to take a picture of it to show her. But the sun had basically set, so all you could see in the picture was like a, a bit of a silhouette. But that's when it started getting weird. I looked up from the picture and saw the silhouette change. It got taller. Like the deer stood up onto its back legs or something. And just stood there. Motionless for way too long. Feeling uneasy now but trying not to get scared. I casually put my phone back into my pocket and started walking home. It was getting quite dark after all and... It's just a, a wild deer, nothing to be scared of, right? So I turned my back to the deer and I begin walking. But something just felt really wrong. It's like I could feel someone staring at me or something. So I quickly look over my shoulder but see nothing. It was very dark now so all I would be able to see is shadow anyway. And I didn't really see anything. Until I saw it again, but it was just wrong. Just sharing this as well makes me feel uneasy, but it was still standing upright, just like it was before I started walking home, but now it was running straight towards me. And that's when I knew that something was completely wrong. This isn't normal. 
So I take off through the first gate and get onto the gravel road, screaming for somebody to help me. My bare feet are getting torn up by the sharp rocks that I'm running over. Fumbling with my phone as I ran, I called my dad, who was thankfully home. I screamed at him that somebody was chasing me. And when I look back, the deer is now gaining, about half the distance away it was when I first saw it running. I can hear my dad on the other end of the phone slamming the front door open and running outside, but I can't hear or see the thing behind me anymore. It's completely dark out now, and all I see is a shadow of something getting 50, 40, 30 feet away. I tear through the creek bed as I run through it, finally seeing my house lights in the distance. I scream as loud as I've screamed in my entire life the breath scratching my lungs as I do so. I'm running uphill now, not stopping once this entire time, and I finally see my dad in front of me running even faster than I am. He jumps the last gate, separating me from my house, and starts yelling, get away. When he finally reaches me, instead of stopping at me, he keeps running past me and keeps yelling. I fall to the ground, barely able to catch my breath, tears streaming down my face. After about 20 seconds... My dad kneels next to me. Did you see it? I force out of my trembling lungs. Son, I don't see anything. Apparently, whatever chased me was afraid of my dad because once he was in view, it must have run away. Now, it's been a year since that happened. I've been made fun of by most people because everyone thinks that it was just a sickly deer with rabies or something. Even my parents do, I guess, but my great uncle, who is literally an expert on wildlife, says that there's just no way that that could have happened. He says that it was most likely a bear, but a bear hasn't been seen here for like 30 plus years, so that seems extremely unlikely. Plus, I don't think bears have antlers, which is something that I distinctly recognized in the shadow that was chasing me.